uh, you know, Council Lady Barbara Henley to uh, give an opening remark before I'm our you know, first presentation. I'm out of here. Right. Uh, we'll see. I used to be teased by a former uh, council person that I always had to talk history as something or other. But anyway, you know, this, this it kind of occurred to me uh, this past week. You know, right now we're planning for a bond referendum next Tuesday. But 60 years ago, at this very time, the Board of Supervisors of Princess Anne County and the Council of Little Town of Virginia Beach was also planning for a referendum. They had a referendum question as whether or not the city, the, the county of Princess Anne should merge with the town of Virginia Beach and establish the large city of Virginia Beach, 310 square miles. <coughs> and this referendum was to be scheduled or was scheduled for January 4th, 1962. So that means we're into the 60 year observance of the creation of the town, of the city of Virginia Beach. Because if you can imagine, there was a tremendous amount of work that had to be done. Can you imagine what those folks were having to do to explain to all of the residents of the county of, <coughs> of Princess Anne and the town of Virginia Beach what a merger would be and why they needed to support that merger question. So that's what was happening 60 years ago. At that time, and when it was first uh, approved, of course, the referendum was approved, but then the General Assembly had to take action. And then all of that year of 62, the people who were the leaders of those entities had to make all the preparations for creating this city, which would officially begin January 1st of 63. So we, we need to, to, I think, look at this time of 60 years and celebrate what has happened to create the city of Virginia Beach and create the city of Virginia Beach as, as it is now. And so I propose that we celebrate the anniversary of the merger uh, by beginning each of our council meetings over the next year with a success of the, of the city of Virginia Beach. Doesn't have to be in chronological order or uh, a, a, an exact history thing, but when you think of all of the successes that the city of Virginia Beach has had over the last 60 years, we're gonna have a hard time making it be uh, one for each week for each council meeting. There's gonna be so many. What has been done? And I think this will give us an opportunity to, to recall the work that was been done, has been done, and to recognize the citizens and the staff who made these things happen. So I propose, as I said, that we begin each of our council meetings for the next year by recognizing an action of success. And we begin to determine what these are gonna be by asking each of our departments throughout the city to think of some of the accomplishments that they have had. Some of the departments weren't even in existence at that time. But what are the successes that each of the departments have had uh, during this time? And who are the people, the staff and the citizens who made these things happen? In, in looking at or listening to our comments last week when we recognized uh, Councilwoman Reba McLannan and thinking about all the work that she did, or Saturday when we were at the uh, dedication of the EMS facility for Bruce Edwards and listening to all the dedication that he had in, in his work for 42 years with the city, there's been a lot that's occurred. And I think this is going to be a great way for us to celebrate the 60 years of Virginia Beach and, and give us the, the honor of recognizing the people and, and the work that's been done. So that's my proposal. No, thank you. And what I'm uh, re recommending that is when we go into council discussion and comments, where we have this uh, uh, segment on initiatives that we also include, you know, uh, the ability to bring forward, like for instance, next time 
There is a uh, country western uh, singer that lives in Virginia Beach of high regard. He's known better in Nashville than here. Uh, you, you know that we're going to just give him a, a little a shout out, and this is, a, and I think if we have it during the council comment session, that we could actually expand and talk about it interactively a little more. You know, when we have the, when we're talking about what initiatives that we've had, and this could be involved with a lot of the people that we interact with, you know, throughout the, the day on the. You know, we got we got a lot of heroes in this city that are out there doing you know some incredibly good things uh, we had a um uh, a baseball player for the dodgers recently hit a significant ho home run in the playoffs Chris but I, I yeah was he cox high school yes yeah. Was. yeah cox high school you know so you know we got a lot to you know blow our horn about as a city as a community so you know i think if you know going forward we'll be doing that thank you mrs henley uh, okay, our first briefing is our esteemed city auditor on stormwater regulatory and inspections program order. Lyndon, how are you? I haven't seen you in a while. Good, thank you. Um, they keep you locked on the third floor. <laughs> <laughs> they let me out every once in a while. So. When are they going to start feeding? <laughs> Uber brings yeah, so. them his stuff. Uh, you got you know. Well, good afternoon, Mayor Dyer. And members of the city council, especially our newest uh, appointed council members, Councilman Hol Holcomb and Councilman Branch, um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present the audit of the Stormwater Regulatory and Inspections Program. Before I get started, I wanted to thank my staff, uh, my deputy city auditor, Gretchen Chudome, who is here, as well as Ken Reinhardt, as well as the staff from Public, Wa uh, Public Works, the, both the regulatory and inspection program. Um, you do have a copy of the full report that I originally emailed to you on Friday. Um, as part of the report, the management response, a very comprehensive management response from uh, Public Works um, is attached, and you will see that many corrective actions and steps have already been taken to address the uh, some of the findings that we have um, noted in our report. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. So the purpose of this audit was to assess the compliance with the city's MS4 permit as it pertains to stormwater management facility <laughs> inspections. This was a planned audit. It was included in our fiscal year. 2021 audit planned and it's just now being completed and presented. Briefly go over some of the objectives of the audit. Determine whether the stormwater management program is operating as in uh, as intended in accordance with the MS4 permit. Determine whether management is performing monitoring controls to ensure inspections are being performed timely and accurately. Determine whether privately owned stormwater management facilities that failed inspections are repaired timely. And if they aren't, were they properly sent to stormwater management regulatory? Determine whether the responsible city departments of publicly owned and privately owned but publicly maintained facilities are notified of the results of failed inspections so they could be properly repaired. And like every audit, we look at the data completeness, the accuracy, the reliability of the data um, that's capturing this information in the applications they're using. Uh, they were formerly using INFOR or, or commonly referred to as Hansen, but effective 1121, they're new, using a new system called Cartograph. Okay, just a b brief background, especially to those. Uh, watching online. Um, what is stormwater? Okay, so there's a good graphic that depicts it's rain, snow, or even ice melt that doesn't soak into the ground. Instead, it flows from our roofs, our pavements, across bare soils, and down into the streets. Why should we care about it? Because stormwater, it picks up everything in its path. The oil, the litter, the pesticides, the leaves, animal waste, and more. All of these items then flow untreated directly into the closest waterway, okay? So this is untreated water, uh, storm water. What's the impact? 
obviously there's an, could be an adverse impact to the quality of the water, um, which we spent millions of dollars and years to help improve that quality of the water. Larger items such as trash, leaves, grass clippings can clog storms and continue con contribute to localized flooding. So obviously, because it impacts the water, it can impact flooding, we should care about it. And we should manage it. And how do we manage it? Okay, it's, we manage it by implementing what are known as best management practices or BMPs. Simply, BMPs are structural, vegetative, managerial practices used to treat, prevent, or reduce that water pollution. Okay, and you can see from the pictures, it doesn't have to be something big, right? It could be a swale, it could be a dry pond, that's, it could be a wet pond, okay? It could be your drains. Um, it could be on private property, public, properly, privately maintained, publicly maintained. Okay? But these are our stormwater, stormwater management facilities. Okay? This is what we were reviewing to ensure they were, in fact, inspecting. Okay? How many assets, and they, ref they refer to these uh, BMPs as assets. There's, uh, as of June 30th, 2021, there were... 744 city owned, 859 privately owned but city maintained, and 1,257 privately owned. Okay, obviously these numbers fluctuate as we're adding assets, as we're deleting assets, but approximately 2,860. Okay, inspectors also perform inspections of all the newly built um, stormwater management facilities called as built before they go into the MS4 permit cycle okay what did we focus on so in order for us to have the ability to discharge water into local waterways um, the ms4 permit requires that we have and take many steps okay we focused our audit on two of those main steps that public works, inspections, and regulatory perform. Uh, so we looked at the inspecting, operating, and maintaining the stormwater system in all city-owned and city-maintained stormwater facilities, and these are to be inspected annually, okay? And then we also looked at the program to ensure the privately-owned stormwater facilities are maintained, and these are required to be inspected once every five years, okay? So public annually, private once every five years, okay? And all of this is managed through public works, through their environmental inspections and spill response bureau. We referred to them as inspections, as well as stormwater regulatory compliance. We referred to them as regulatory, okay? And I know this is hard to see, but this is in your report. But briefly, the inspection process. So annually, they schedule out. This is what we're going to do for the year. Um, okay, so they schedule, they inspect, okay, depending on what type of BMP it is. Um, it could be, you know, manholes, it could be a lake. Um, they inspect it. If it passes, they make a notation, enter the information into art cartograph. If it fails, uh, a non compliance letter is provided to the owner. Um, they'll work with the owner um, to ensure the work is done. They'll reinspect. If it fails again, they'll provide another notice. And if it still doesn't pass, then it is sent to the regulatory division. Okay? So we're looking at both aspects inspections and regulatory. But in a nutshell, that's the process. All right, so what did we find? Um, the results really get into three areas that we'll get into some detail is the data completeness because we always start no matter what system we're looking at is the completeness of the data because it's garbage in garbage out um, the uh, actual inspection process and then the, the third finding we had related to if a asset failed inspection did we take timely action did we take timely corrective action? Because the last thing we want is BMPs that we are relying on to function, uh, to function as they were built 
uh, to not properly be working because they are in a condition of failure, okay? All right, so the results, th the first one is the data. Um, as I mentioned, they switched from one system from Hansen to cart cartograph. So we, <clears throat> we analyzed the data and we can see in some, you know, in some of the data, some of the key elements, um, some of the fields are missing. Um, so we've moved to a new system. A lot of that has been migrated over. Um, but in this case, if you look at a cartograph, like the light of results equals blank. So if an inspection has been performed, you shouldn't see a result that equals blank. Okay. So missing inspection data impacts monitoring and reporting capabilities by management and the city's ability to ensure compliance with the MS4 permit. If you don't have all the data, if you're trying to run management and data reports, it's hard when you don't have all the data. Okay. Uh, some other, and this is now coming out of Cartograph, the newer system, analyzing the data, some other exceptions that we saw. Asset descriptions are blank, locations are blank, the owner's address is blank, watershed are blank, watershed number. And again, when you're trying to run data, if the data hasn't properly been input upon the completion of an inspection, as I mentioned, it's hard to um, have accurate reporting data, okay? So the recommendations enhance the completeness and accuracy of information related to stormwater inspections. Management should explore system and field configuration options to require data input and or test of data validity. Design and develop exception-based reports to identify potential data omissions and or entry errors. <laughs> include data accuracy and completeness of key data fields in the inspection review process. All right, and as I said, management has already taken action and they're in the process of implementing these recommendations. All right, before I move on, any questions? Or do you want me to just keep rolling any, through it? Any questions? I'll wait till the end. Okay, okay. so I'll just, I'll just roll through the, uh, the findings. All right, now finding twos, we actually get into the inspection process. So we're, again, we're looking at the data. This chart basically spells out the various status of the result of the inspection. So these are for all the active as assets. What was the latest inspection? And what we did was focus on those in the degraded and serious condition. Right, call, uh, column three and column four, degraded and serious. Okay, the, the blue represents the public that was in that condition. The orange represents private, okay? We selected a sample of the failed inspections based on the latest inspections. Um, we wanted to look to see if the inspection reports were available. Um, if follow-up inspections have been scheduled and completed, right, because it's one thing to fail, but the step is, are we following up? Are we sending uh, the letters? Are we working with the owners? Because ultimately, we want these BMPs to be correct. And if no action has been taken, we also tested to ensure they were sent to our regulatory unit for further action. All right, what did we find? Um, so basically, this chart states, number one, inspection reports were not attached, so we didn't, even, we didn't see an inspection report in cartograph. There were five of those that were in serious condition, one in de degraded condition, um, where we didn't find an inspection report. Were we inspection scheduled? In essence, are we following up? Okay, we had eight that were, that were in serious condition, four degraded, so a total of 12 exceptions. Of those that should have been sent to regulatory, um, there were a total of 18, okay? And then we also noted there were six, five private, one public, in the cartograph asset inventory system where we did not see any evidence that these assets were inspected during the five-year permit cycle, okay? 
And there's various reasons, you know, there's, there's been turnover, there, they change systems, so some things didn't properly migrate over. Um, and there was, you know, just some oversight that, that led to these. These have all been provided to uh, management and they are, they have investigated and they're looking and as a matter of fact, they've already scheduled um, some of the follow-up for some of these assets, okay? So obviously we don't, we want to ensure that every asset is properly inspected, documented, um, and follow-up action is taken. So the recommendations to ensure inspections are performed in accordance with specified policies, we recommend the fall. We want to ensure to develop a formal inspection review process, okay? Um, this should include, at a minimum, write a sample of the inspections, then create, in, within this new system, they now have the ability to create dashboard reports and other quality control procedures to ensure assets that require inspections are in fact inspected. Data and forms including inspections report are included. Inspections and reinspections are accurately scheduled. Those in the failed status are repaired timely and do not simply get rescheduled for the next inspection cycle. The process should include creating the work orders. Um, all open work orders are tracked until corrective action is taken. Okay. All right, so finding three, once we determined that there were assets that were in a degraded or serious condition, we wanted to know how long were they in that condition. So we did an, what we call an aging of those inspections, okay? And so this chart ages those that are in serious condition, okay? And we define serious as immediate need for repair or replacement. So as you can see, there was 21 assets in serious condition, and they've been in that condition for over 12 months. 16 of those 21 have been in serious condition for over 24 months. Okay. Okay, again, that's something we don't want to see. All right, we did the same thing. We did an aging report for those that had an inspection result of degraded. Degraded means poorly maintained, routine maintenance recommended, and some sort of repair is needed for that BMP uh, to ensure it's properly functioning, okay? We noted 234 assets in a degraded condition for over 12 months, and then there were 161 in a degraded condition for over 24 months. All right, to address the backlog and ensure continued compliance with the MS4 permit, a dedicated stormwater facilities maintenance crew was approved by, by the council in fiscal year 2022. At the time of our audit, the maintenance crew and the necessary equipment to perform the work was <laughs> being assembled and work was scheduled and just getting underway, okay? And they have assured us that with the new resources, that will definitely help make a dent in this backlog. So far, approximately 50% of the degraded uh, assets that are a responsibility of public works have maintenance scheduled or planned. All right, so the related find recommendations, and again, in their response, they detail uh, the corrective action they have taken um, or have already corrected. <clears throat> but we said, review each BMP asset currently in a serious or degraded condition and determine the corrective action that needs to be taken. If it needs to be sent to regulatory for further action, correction, or data entry, then immediately it needs to be sent, okay? Add a conditions field to the inspection area to track the status of the failed asset. Is corrective action needed? Is there a work order scheduled? Is it sent to regulatory? Is corrective action taken? 
again, that way it'll be easier for management mm -hmm. to know where are we at, where are we at with these assets. Design and develop dashboard gadgets, and that's what they call them in their new system, <laughs> to identify and monitor assets in degraded or serious condition and track it all the way through. So we're not getting to 12 months, 24 months of inaction. Um, and then quarterly reconcile the assets and cartograph to the referrals received list maintained by regulatory to ensure that in fact those assets that needed to go over from inspections to regulatory have in fact been sent over. Okay. Um, so we as part of audit we did a lot of work, we did a lot of interviews, we did a lot of ride-alongs. I've learned certainly learned more about BMPs. I go around driving around the city and pointing out to my wife, that's a BMP, that's a BMP. Um, Ain't that a gas station? <laughs> that's BP. Um, but overall, I do want to acknowledge the work that inspections and regulatory have done. There has been a lot of taint, turnover. Um, both units were, in fact, impacted by the May 31st tragedy. There has been a, a, a new system. Um, overall, we determined that the inspections program, except where noted, is operating effectively in accordance with policy set forth by the city. Um, we acknowledge that action has been taken. And again, I want to thank them for their full cooperation and responsiveness um, during the audit. Okay. Um, if anybody in the public is interested, the full report can be found at vbgov.com slash city audit. Thank, thank you. you. Any questions? Mr. Moss? Uh, we go to slide 13, please. And first of all, thank you for your very informative report. And I'm just trying to make sure I understand the full thing. Um, obviously, you were looking at the process of inspection, but also compliance. So when you look at, when they say these are in good condition, since the purpose of the permit is to reduce suspended solids and other pollutants from entering the discharge at the final place of outfall, what is the standard, when someone says it's good condition, how is that assessment determined against the metric of the performance of the BMP to reduce suspended solids? Were those inspections during, done a stress test or an actual storm events? Or how do we know it's in good condition if we can't measure if it's performing the reduction it's supposed to do? Okay, that is a good question. That's probably better answered by someone from the inspections program. But there is a comprehensive. Well, be okay. Yeah, I have more on. questions before he answers that because I want to get back how you, what you. So, what we looked on. at, we actually looked at the inspection reports that mirror the criteria that DEQ provides so there are certain depending on the type of the type of the assets there's their various criteria um, for them to determine the status and condition of the asset so when you did this gets back to my question because you relied upon this sample size to make that determination that's correct. correct that is correct was how did you determine the sample size is that statistically significant did you validate it for small sample size these are very small samples yeah sizes. so what we did was we focused on those that were in a failed condition so we actually looked at a hundred percent of the degraded and a sample of those in series. So you just accepted as valid the conditions for the other BMPs? That's correct. Okay, so I'm just trying to make sure I understand the fidelity of the yeah, finding. Yeah, that's correct. So when you get to the failed one, that's on slide 14, and you look at that sample, that's a very small sample size, so there's a lot of statistical care you have to take with very small sample sizes. Did you actually do that statistically? Yes, so as I mentioned here, for the, um, for the series, we looked at 100%, and the, a sample size of 30 uh, are external auditors. Whenever you get above a certain amount, a sample size of 30 is statistically valid. And so we utilize a sample of 30 out of the 624. And the 30 would represent the full spectrum of types of BMPs? That's correct. 
Can I just get that later? I'd like to see sure. the methodology yes. that you use. Absolutely. That would be educational for me. So what we don't know is during that time frame, I'm getting back to this conclusion of how effective our program is, because if we don't know the damage that was done during the five years when these things were performing, when we didn't inspect them, and then the ones that were seriously degraded that we didn't repair, the MST format permit deals with the reduction. So we don't know how much additional pollutants left that BMP that weren't supposed to leave the BMP. We don't know that. That's correct. So the real issue of output, of effectiveness, efficiency of process is one thing, but the effectiveness of the program is the <clears throat> reduction in pollutants, which could have been quite serious from those selective BMPs, correct? That's correct. So we really don't know how effective our program has been because we don't know the for damage the, yeah, that for, done. for the overall. And it, uh, DEQ, and the reason we focus on the inspection piece, DEQ, they go in and they perform their more comprehensive audit once every five years, and they do measure uh, some of those variables you mentioned. Well, well my point being is, and, I'm, and I think inspection compliance, but if you measure it at five years, you don't know how long it's been degraded. That's correct. You really don't know what's happened. And I'm only trying to make that's because citizens are out there watching and people I've been talking through this bond referendum ask lots of questions about how effective our programs are, what they see in their neighborhoods. And I can just tell you that when they see that we have an effective program, you couldn't sell that out on the circuit I've been on. <laughs> so I'm just trying to understand what effective means. I think you're saying is that we have effectively inspected the program. That's correct. But we that's do correct. not know if the programs are effectively operating to reduce pollution. Yeah. And that's I why think I, that's I, an important point to make because I don't want the citizens to think yeah. that I certainly believe that we know whether or not our yeah. program has been up. That's why we want to make sure what the scope and the objectives were as it related to inspections and regulatory programs. And I, I have a lot of history with that failure BMP. But what I also would like to know is when we talk about the, the technology, and I know you didn't make recommendations on the material solutions, but I would suggest that uh, we don't want to have a gazillion people out there. We've got to figure out how to use drones and LIDAR to measure the depths of these places. We've got to look about how to have automated sensors that are self-reporting and self-populating databases. This technology is here today. You know, if we don't need people as the answer to getting, and I'm not saying you suggested that, but I'm just, as I look here, we've obviously, and I don't know, when you started this audit, what year did you start this audit? We started this in, I believe, June, earlier June this year. So when you went in there, how much did the department have self-cognizance that they, <coughs> what situation they were in, and to what extent did your audit have to educate line management what the condition of their inspection system was? I'm not sure if they were aware the extent, or at least initially, they didn't share that with us. It was, um, you know, a matter of. I guess we'll find you'll find out. <laughs> well, really, and this is an important question because it gets back to it. I know. Yeah, the I mean, they, they with with the data they had and and the transition, um, they were very open, but they didn't say you're going to find this, um, but they didn't say everything was perfect as well. They acknowledge there, there's probably some opportunities out there. Um, and as we started looking through the data, I think some of the things were very surprising to them as well. Um, and I think that's why they were appreciative of, of bringing this information. Well, this is why these audits, your function is so value added. But the importance, and I've had this conversation with the manager, you know, we pay good money, and rightfully so, for line management to do line management functions. It's one thing if line <laughs> management knows what their deficiencies are, and they've elevated them in the budget, and we've just refused to fund it and accepted the risk. It's another thing for line management to be ignorance of their performance and not know what the problem is. And, and, and when I yeah. read through this, I think there's a little bit of both. Well, they knew they were behind, and they needed resources for repairs. But it, the extent of you know how long those assets were in those conditions, I'm not sure if they, yeah. they were aware. When you that. say five years, that's a long time. That's someone who has a job that's, that owes, never be the most senior person knows something, and it may be the culture, so I'm not blaming the people at the deck plate. But my point being, going forward, really, if there's line management at the top, they really are running big operations, and we have every expectation, I know the manager does as well, 
that they're on top of their game. And this is what the public is pinging on us is, you know, they're not, ignorance is not an excuse with them. And they're like saying, how come, how come, how come? And I know big organizations have difficulty and complexity, but your report points out just how big the gap is and that the public's concerns are not unfounded. And you know, and that's, that's a headwind that we are, are fighting and I'm out there every day telling people trust us, we got new leadership, new management, new people running the departments and we need to do better. So I know our metrics going forward in that dashboard uh, professional we bought and I think Mr. Mayor, we know we have issues and, and talking about your problems is a good thing but, un but people need to understand their part. That we, the public does expect the people to know their operations best and don't assume risk. I mean, I know people sometimes don't bring stuff to council, don't know we have a problem. I think everybody up here wants to know what the problems are. Hmm. You know, let us be the ones responsible for not fixing them by not providing the funding, but don't hide the problems. And we really do need to understand the impact on the environment of these not maintaining these systems. Because in the end, that's what the MS4 permit is all about, not about <clears throat> the inspections. It's about improving the waterways. And that's what we need to focus on. I'm, I know that CJ knows that. I'm not saying anything he doesn't know. And that's not, that's not any personal criticism of the, the new leadership. But it does point out we have a lot of homework to do. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dehaney yeah. and then Ms. Uh, yeah, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Moss, I just wanted to um, articulate the fact that council with the passage of the budget on July 1 did create a BMP crew. So this did not take that into account as part of that. So council, we did bring this to council attention that this was a deficiency and council so kindly funded a BMP crew for us to be more proactive and address these issues. So hopefully in the future, whenever this comes back in the um, cadence for an audit, we should see better improvement on these um, issues here. Thank you. Ms. Henley. Well, for years, we've been getting reports from Public Works that say that we have much longer cycles of getting this work done than we should have. Mm -hmm. I wish I'd brought some of those old reports because we've been being told, for example, we were many years, it was a, a long cycle at fixing the BMPs or fixing the canals. or those. And that's one of the things that I think in our resolution for the referendum that we have said to the public that if we do have this additional uh, bond money, then this will help free up money that we then can get these maintenance cycles at a reasonable rate. And it's not that the council has not been aware of how long these cycles have been. And you know, when we have not done what we had been told we needed to do, and that was bump up the um, stormwater fee every year to be able to provide additional funding. I mean, so we can't say the council was not aware that these cycles were much longer than they needed to be. Um, and like I said, we've been told that. And that's one of the things that I'm hoping that we are sending the message with the, the bond referendum money that one of the things that we're going to do is to get these, these cycles at a much better um, time frame. And um, so I, I, I think we need to, I'm hoping that we'll have a very positive ability after next week to look at what this maintenance is going to be. And we did in this year's budget have a new crew for uh, canal maintenance and also for uh, ditch maintenance. <coughs> And I think the very fact that we did put that in this year's budget, and I'm assuming those people now are probably hired and are getting ready to get out there and get the work done so. Uh, mm -hmm. so that we can, we can catch these things up. So I, I think it's good that we, you know, we have these, uh, these analysis to know just what our, what our shortcomings are. But I think that's something that, you know, we have got to make sure that we provide the wherewithal to be able to get out there and to do the work. But you know, one of the things that was kind of funny, um, earlier this year, when a, one in particular over on, um, I guess it's Nemo Parkway near the rec center in the yeah. library, when one of the big BMPs was being cleaned up, yes. <laughs> I got complaints that we were out there cutting down the trees. <laughs> Well, you know, the BMP was, had been there so long and hadn't been maintained that there were trees growing in it. So that 
people need to understand that if we're going to return these BMPs to what it should be, that what they have gotten used to seeing has to be yes. changed. And so there's also a, a major um, informational uh, process that we go to need to go through if we're going to get these BMPs cleaned up and if it's supposed to be a wet BMP instead of a dry BMP or whatever it's got to be, I don't understand all of that, but we, know, we really need to work with the neighborhoods where these are, are located to make certain that we are uh, doing what people understand is the right thing, thing to do because I think every one of them is probably different and there's a lot to do. But I, I think the very fact, I would like to know, you said that you, your, your uh, scope of um, sample size was 100% of the degraded, is that correct? 100% of the serious. So if you look at the second column where it says serious, there were 38 in that condition, um, and we looked at all of them. Okay. And then for the, the degraded. The degraded, you looked at 100% at of them. Yeah, of the, of the most of the serious. the total number of BMPs that were out there, I, I look and I just see different numbers. I'm just trying to see how many of the total were in these. I'm, we've got so many different charts. I'm yeah, so this one right here, these are the various conditions, good, moderate. We focused on the degraded and the serious. Right, yeah, I, I got that part, but I wasn't quite sure of what the total number. Yeah, so the total the number, I think it's right I here. You know, the percentage that's degraded. I think it was 2060, I think. It's a very small, when you look at the actual percentage. So what's, what's the total number? Let's see. Gretchen, what was that? What's our total population? Okay, so that, what chart is it? Yes, yeah, about 2180. Yeah, 2860 on page six. There's about 2860 assets. Right, I was getting different totals as I was looking at each of these things. So we're looking at. Yeah, so there's about 2,860, so in total. 860. 2,860 assets. So the total degraded. So total degraded was 624, and 38 were in serious condition. Okay. So 2,200 are in good shape. Yes. Okay. Well, I don't know if we can say that. We can well, say not we don't know how well they're performing. That's the part I think yeah. we're missing is the performance characteristics of the BMP. Okay. Right. So, anyone else? Do we want to have, does LJ want to? or comments or before we wrap this up. Mr. Moss, I think you had a question about what constitutes our inspection process <clears throat> and how something becomes probably classified as degraded or serious. Yeah, the stress that you put it under when you test it, what's the stress condition? It, it, is, not a, it is not a performance evaluation like you would for a piece of equipment uh, where you stress it. There is a, a criteria that is established by the Department of Environmental Quality that is put forth and it says that this is the standard that, uh, that this type of BMP has to be built to. And if the, if the facilities are constructed and are being maintained appropriately, then they are considered to be in compliance. If they have issues such as erosion or if you have outfalls that are that are falling in or obstructed, if you have growth that is not this inappropriate, if it's a filtration BMP and it's holding water, I know that that's a particular interest of yours. Those are all things that go towards its overall condition. Um, for instance, a filtration pond that is ho that is holding water that would be a serious. We would consider that to be serious. So when we look at one of those, which was the failure BMP, is an exact case of that. 
So when we look at that and it's not performing for a period of years and with water it's a duck pond when it's supposed to be a dry retention basis, do we have an ability to extrapolate for its non-performance what the impact of that is? We don't. We don't. That, that's, not our, that's not a requirement of our MS4 permit and it's not, it's not an element that we currently, that we currently uh, engage in. Nor do we quantify if a, if a BMP is overperforming. It is, it is generally assumed that as part of our MS4 program, we're going to have some that overperform and some that underperform. And on the whole, that if they're constructed in accordance with, with the standards and they're maintained in accordance with the standards, that we'll get the, the pollutant load reduction that we're seeking. Given that we're just, would that mean that we could then do uh, overflight digitized inspections and use LIDAR radar to look at the performance and saying they're meeting the design build characteristics because we're not testing anything relative to the water if we're assuming the performance of the system is built? So could that not be validated by other than in-person viewing? I believe our permit requires us to actually physically visit the site. I mean. Is it possible? Could we ask for a for a modification? I suppose, but I don't know that that would necessarily give us everything that we'd like to know. It'll be interesting to pursue because obviously, causing people to go out and look at stuff and say, "Yep, looks good," and I'm not saying that's all that they do, but if that can be done by another means and meet the regulatory compliance, we should be doing it at the least cost possible. I, I could see where maybe an overflight might be a useful tool, but I don't think that it would it would do the same thing that a that it's worth pursuing. Does. Yes, sir. Okay. One last question. Any, anyone else? Yes, Just Mr. LJ, Brent. there's about a dozen recommendations here. Do you intend on following all of them? Yes, sir. I think if you'll look at the at our follow-up report, you'll see that we've already made progress on a lot of them. And I really like I like the idea of looking at that aging report. I think that's a very a, a very good way to look at it. If I make can I sure. slip to that? Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry, going the wrong direction. Um, one of the things that I that I did want to point out was that if you look at that, first of all, serious condition, 38 out of 2,000, what was it, 2,800, 2, 2, what is that, about 0.2%. Uh, on my, in my estimation, serious condition, 0.2%, not bad for a city the size of Virginia Beach. Not acceptable, but it's not bad. Um, I would also point out that the city of Virginia Beach, our regulatory program, also was audited by DEQ just in advance of the audit that was performed by the city auditor, and we did receive favorable marks in our review. Um, one thing I did want to point out in the aging, if you look, if you look, the the orange indicates that those are publicly maintained. So looking from the left, uh, you see a lot of orange on the left, more blue on the right. That indicates what our issues and our challenges are working with those that are privately maintained. Privately maintained BMPs are, are more difficult for us to get resolved, to, meaning that we have to work with a, with a homeowner or an HOA or those types of things, and that has to go through the regulatory uh, process that that was identified by the auditor. So I just wanted to point that out. I, I think this is a great illustration, and it's certainly something that I intend to keep an eye on moving forward. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen, and uh, Mr. Ramius. I just wanted to thank you. Uh, one of the points of pride of Virginia Beach is our internal auditor and the process. Uh, you are recognized as one of the top experts in the region, if not in the country and you give the city of Virginia Beach a great amount of credibility, integrity, and uh, transparency. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Dehaney. Mr. Mayor, members of council, at this time our newly minted housing director, Ruth Hill, will provide a, a presentation to council about a Get Give program that we'll like to present to council to get approval to move forward. Hi, Ruth. How are you doing? Hi, Mayor Dyer. Good afternoon, council members. I have the presentation with me. Good afternoon, and thank you for your time, um, Mayor Dyer, council members, and thank you. again, Mr. Holcomb, congratulations, and Linwood, it's good to see you in thank this you. seat again. So congratulations thank you. to you. Thank you. I appreciate right. that. Um, I'm going to talk to you today and just give you an overview about a new homelessness awareness campaign and how we got here. So I'm going to 
talk to you a little bit about the background and just give you an understanding of how this this came about. There were two issues that uh, came to our attention. One is the con the issue and the concern that continues to to happen in the city of Virginia Beach around the increased presence of homeless persons at the oceanfront. Um, and then the second was around panhandling and we had a council member that engaged us, uh, um, Ms. Wooten, up in 2019 to look at this issue, and so that's where this uh, process started. What we did for the concern around the increased presence of unsheltered homelessness was we actually transitioned two um, outreach workers that are now at the resort management office, and so they are there not only, um, they are there permanently, and they work out of that office under Lisa Bleakley, and that has been, we found that to be right, quite successful. Um, they also have um, hours that are sometimes in the morning, sometimes in the evening, and we have some weekend hours, so we enhanced what's happening there. Um, and under the panhandling, we had an informal assessment of panhandling that was done by 3rd Precinct Captain Rio Hatfield and his team in the fall of 2019. And what we discovered was 30 to 40 percent of those panhandling in our city were actually not homeless. Um, interesting, I went back and looked at the statistics today, um, 57 percent of those, and it was just a small sampling, it wasn't a scientific um, survey, but were not Virginia Beach residents at all. So people at that time, and probably continue to come in here because we are a very giving and caring community and people can resource themselves. Um, we did a presentation in 2019 to the council and talked about the intersectionality between poverty and homelessness and how that is connected. And so. Um, so we researched some other panhandling campaigns in other communities, and we also talked to traffic engineering, and they did not recommend right-of-way signage, which was one of the considerations, and so this campaign has come out of that. Um, for those of you that have been around for a while, in 2010, the RAC, um, the Resort Advisory Commission, actually launched this campaign to do a, um, a parking meter in the oceanfront, and we had 16 parking meters that re were repurposed, and we actually, people had an ability to actually put coinage and raise money towards an, um, ending homelessness in the city. There had been a decline in donations, as we all know. Um, many people don't carry coinage anymore, and the condition of the meters deteriorated. So in June of this year, we removed all of them, um, and we um, presented this opportunity for new signage. Additionally, I wanted to share with you that um, we have a community of one approach in our city that entails not only the um, city of Virginia Beach, but also partnerships with the faith community and nonprofits that are working to end homelessness. And so we've been doing this for over 30 years in our city. Um, our Continuum of Care, which is our HUD um, funding um, coalition, is part of that coalition. And there's, um, we are the coordinating agency under DHMP for that initiative. And so we decided we put together a get help and give help campaign. And so what we're doing is we're doing a positive approach to how we can address this issue. Rather than telling people don't give, we're giving them opportunity for how to give. Rather than telling people um, don't panhandle, we're gonna give them an opportunity of how to get help. And so this, is, this speaks to how we're doing that. Um, it's speaking to a broader audience. Um, it's also recognizing that work of that beach community partnership that's been going on for 30 years where we're bringing that uh, collective impact of of the community together so all of the players can benefit from this approach. Our goals are to connect people to the resources that are in our city and our community, to promote community engagement. We want to create a greater understanding of homelessness in our city. And then also, of course, the, the whole campaign um, methodology is around raising awareness. So this is an um, a picture of what the new signage will look like, and you should have gotten a, a picture of where these signs will go in your Friday packet. But they're going to be 12 by 18 aluminum signs with an updated message. The big connection here that we're doing that's different is we, we have a QR code now. So people can actually scan it and go 
excuse me, I'll get that in a minute, go straight to the, um, the website. And what that website will do was, is going to take them to the, the different areas of, of interest that they have. We are proposing 30 signs at, in, throughout the resort area, and it'll be around restrooms, parking garages, light poles, staging areas. We actually met with um, the city planners, our homeless outreach team, the block by block ambassadors, and parks and wretch wreck to determine where these signs should be and it re really is around areas where the um, the unsheltered were congregating the most where they could get the assistance that they need in terms of resource and also um, much of the panhandling was happening so we're working on a new website that will be launched. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute, about the date. But it's our new community uh, partnership, and it's beachcommunitypartnership.org. Uh, the collateral, as I said before, is going to include these uh, QR codes and these um, get and give help buttons. So for the get help campaign, what we're looking at is the houses, uh, the homeless regional houses Regional Housing Crisis Hotline, excuse me, um, which is really our point of initial point of connection for people in a housing crisis. There's also Samaritan House has a crisis hotline and Seton Youth Crisis Hotline. So all of those places will be there where people can get help. And then we have a list of the support services that are available, including food, shelter services, health services, employment, veterans, and much, much more. Um, so you can see that, that one piece where you can see the community resource categories are all listis, listed there. And in the Give Help campaign, um, we're going to link to partners and their information. And so that's an option for people to go and choose who they, what cause and what organization they would like to connect to. Um, we have, as you may remember, VB Home um, is a at foundation that helps assist the city of Virginia Beach and the other partners and so there's a way that they can connect to VB Home Now Foundation. There's also connection to JCOC, um, Samaritan House, all of the other big providers that are doing homeless services work in our city. The other thing that I wanted to point out was one of the things we're hoping to do is also to engage some new partnerships, particularly around landlord partnerships that we're needing to get landlords connected to what we're doing and we think this is a good way to, to do that activity. So there'll be a community toolkit and DHMP will have this in our community so we will provide some of this collateral but it's also available on site so online excuse me so people could actually download it and have it in their businesses have it in their organizations for people to use. Um, we will also ensure that the block by block ambassadors have collateral if they, if they need it. Other key information is we're going to make sure that our community partnership, Beach, has the mission and the goal is listed there, and there's opportunities for people to connect to membership if they're interested. And then um, an overarching um, understanding of homelessness issues so people can get more information and be educated about homeless services in our city. So everybody asks, how are we going to measure success? And I think this is really important that we look at it and say, okay, you've put this awareness campaign together, but, you know, is it going to do anything? And we're going to really look at the hotline data and the connections to resources. So when people connect to the hotline, there's an assessment done, and we can find out whether they came through that QR code or not, so we'll be able to gather data that way. Um, and then we're going to use our partners and engage them and ask us to share with us about whether on the, the donation side, the Give Help campaign, they receive some donations, but also increasing the community partnership, how many people connect, connected to memberships, landlord partnerships, all of that data we'll be able to, to connect with. We'll look at web at analytics and social media engagement as well to see how many people are, are going to the website from there. So our next steps and what we're going to do in terms of launch is that our campaign will be launched on the National Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Week, which is November 13th through 21st. We this summer had some stakeholder meetings that I know Mr. Tower was at, attended one. Um, we, we met with Beach Community Partnership, the Oceanfront Enhancement Committee, the Resort Advisory Commission, Bayfront Advisory, and then CDBA. We also um, met with them uh, and, and listened to some of their ideas. 
this. And then uh, we're doing this briefing today. We'll finalize and print the collateral, and then we hope to launch the website right before the campaign launches in the middle of November. So, Ruth, thank you so yes. much. Mr. Tower? I, first, I'd just like to congratulate you, thank Ruth. You, thank Mr. you uh, for all your service, and we we'll look forward to your leadership. Thank you. And uh, I think this is a great idea myself, thank personal you. opinion, but. Uh, this is the best idea. I know there was some controversy of folks at the beach about yeah. about which which way to go, what we needed. Yeah. <clears throat> I like this very much, and I uh, appreciate all the work <coughs> that's gone into it. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so much, Mr. Tower. Okay, Mr. Branch. Thank you, Ruthie. Hey. Um, the Housing Resource Center, how is that performing? Are we at peak capacity there, or can mm. you just tell us a little bit about sure. that? Sure. Yes, sir. We stayed at peak capacity. We... Um, um, during the pandemic, what we did was we um, we decongregated down to 50 percent, and then in May of this year, we opened back up to 75 percent, and then in July, we opened up at 100 percent, and we have been rocking and rolling ever since. As soon as people move out or get housed or leave, we are putting people back in, um, and we to date have had nobody that has con attracted COVID uh, in our shelter program at the HRC. So we're real pleased about that statistic. What about your success rate of um, keeping people from returning to homelessness after they've been in that facility? Yeah, so um, I don't have the data in my head, um, Linwood, but I will say that our, our data is actually really good. Um, the last, what I remember from the last um, annual uh, or uh, beach community partnership meeting what's it's about 60 to 70 percent of people are not turning back to homelessness so it's it's pretty high so I don't think it's as high as we'd like it to be we'd like it to be 75 percent or higher but it's 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 not a poor rate mm -hmm. yeah Miss Henley actually I think Mr. Branch has asked most of my questions but what is the gap between what is it that we're not meeting with homelessness that with the shelter. So, so uh, honestly, um, we are. It's it's a capacity issue, Miss Henley. I mean, we have more people experiencing homelessness, needing shelter beds, and needing housing than we have in our system. And right now, with the way that um, low income housing. Um, units are there just isn't enough. We currently are very, very resource rich and have a lot of funding to provide housing for people on a, uh, a temporary and a long-term basis, permanent basis, but we can't find units. Um, so it's taking a long time for people. Uh, the, the length of stay is actually longer during the pandemic than it has been because we can't get them out into affordable <coughs> units as quickly as we'd like to. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the, um before we had the Housing Resource Center, mm -hmm. but then it, it continued, I think, at least the first year, we still were using the churches during the winter. Are mm -hmm. we are we able to do that now? I so guess we didn't during the pandemic, or is it a need? Yeah. Are we going to be Great doing Great question. That? Yes, ma'am. We just finalized our plan today. Um, last year, we did not do uh, congregate sheltering because it was not safe. This year, there's a plan together uh, to put together to use the, the faith community again, and our goal is to have 60 persons that are up to 60 people that will use the winter shelter program again in the churches. Um, we're meeting with uh, Deputy um, Deputy Director uh, Annie Williams um, from the Department of Health to go over that plan to make sure we have all mitigated all the issues around COVID. Um, and Pin Ministries will be the contracted provider to do that work this year. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You, Mr. Ross and then Mr. Moss. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, good evening, Ms. Uh, Ms. Ruth. Good Thank you for your presentation. You're welcome. Um, I noticed throughout your presentation, I didn't necessarily see a plan um, centered around transportation. I know um, mm -hmm. that's a huge issue uh, with homelessness is transportation to and from uh, specifically the ocean front to our housing resource mm -hmm. center um, and, and on Woodstock. But it, and also um, transportation is, is really, really important towards DMVs, trying to get IDs mm -hmm. and to potential um, mm -hmm. job security. So did you all look at that and in, in, in seeing how, what kind of resources you can develop to yeah. um, to look at transportation um, 
yeah. specifically? Yes, sir. So currently we have an outreach team, uh, two, two outreach teams. We have the Westward team and we have the Oceanfront team. Both have access to vans and vehicles. And so transportation is a non-issue. Mm -hmm. If people need transportation to oh, and from the HRC, our outreach team will do that. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's never a concern. We also have the ability to provide bus tickets. Um, for people that need transportation other places that may not be the HRC. So our outreach team has access to that. Mm -hmm. And our outreach team, what I, I didn't share, but they have iPads and they actually can do an assessment um, in real time on the street with somebody. They don't have to call the hotline. They can do it with the person in encampment that they're finding on the street. Right. If they're ab able and willing to come to the HRC um, and get connected to housing, that happens immediately. They don't have to even come into shelter. Mm -hmm. We have such a sophisticated system right now that we know every day whether a shelter or a permanent supportive housing bed vacancy is available. Mm -hmm. If that person is on the list for the next available vacancy, mm -hmm. they actually can get placed from um, the street straight into the shelter bed or the permanent um, That's great. supportive housing unit. So can you, yes. Ms. Mayor, if I can follow up, can you walk me through um, if there's a homeless person at the ocean front mm -hmm. and they needed to get to the housing resource center, mm -hmm. can you walk me through the how, how does that work? Does so, somebody find them? or? Like right. Just, so with our outreach team, they canvass all day. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they, they partner with other businesses and, mm -hmm. and particularly right now with the Block by Block mm -hmm. uh, ambassadors. So um, if it's somebody unknown to them, we, we know many and most of the people that are um, experiencing homelessness at the oceanfront. Mm -hmm. They do a connection through... Uh, through a cell phone and our outreach team will go and engage with them and do an assessment, a screening and assessment and connect them to services uh, real time right there. Uh, so I guess my question more specifically is does a, a van then pick them up depending on the assessment or do they, do you point them to the bus stop or how so do you it depends. It's, from? it's really individualized depending on the need of the client. And so if they need <coughs> a ride to the HRC at that moment because they need a shower and they need mm -hmm. a meal and they need to do their laundry, then the outreach team takes them in their van and takes them straight oh, okay. there. So right. it's, 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 it's just that quick. All right. Thank you, Mr. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Moss. I applaud your use of technology. That is, that is really enabling everybody to be much more customer focused, timely. My application. Thank you, sir. I look forward to working with you on the Virginia Beach Community Development Housing. Thank group you, there. sir. And uh, just for a point of reference, we also got a memo from the city manager telling us that Norfolk in four hours got 11,000 applications for subsidized housing. And we only operated ours for a day. I don't know how many we got, but I'm sure. And it's just uh, a big issue, and I applaud the heavy lifting you have to do. I'm assuming on your one of your measures of success wasn't reducing the density of panhandling or reducing the density of homeless. I think that was probably conscious because you can't control that. Correct. But I would assume that since you talked about, though not statistically, that a significant percentage, but not a majority, mm -hmm. I won't call them <coughs> professional panhandlers, but they're not homeless. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure in your, as you do your targeting, you know who that audience is, because I think all of us in our own neighborhood know who those audiences are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're, they're regulars. Yeah. And, uh, but, but, you, but you do have an attempt to not, to have, maybe have the same number that are not part of the professional set, but the people really in need, that might continue to be. But you, are, you do have some sense of, of that population that you're trying to, as Mr. Branch talked about, get permanently placed out of housing. Sure. But because the need's so great, it's sure. just going to backfill. Sure. I understand that. I'm just trying to make sure that we aren't, we recognize that the professionals are going to still be there yeah. despite what programs yeah. we have. Right. I appreciate all the work that you do. Thank it's you, like, sir. It's heavy lifting. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Mr. Holcomb and then Ms. Wooten. That, Mr. Moss just asked a question I had because we're, you know, we're competing against that 30 to 40 percent that you talked about mm -hmm. that are, they're making it bad for everybody else. Mm -hmm. So this is more of an education for the, mm -hmm. uh, for the community to say, mm -hmm. hey, don't give there, right. give where right. we right. where we recommend. Right. And so that 30 to 40 that's not homeless is, is certainly making it tough on everybody else. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Ms. Wood. Yes, good afternoon. Um, I think my overall comment is that it's um, really good to see this program come to fruition. Mm -hmm. So long that you all have been working on the program. I'm specifically um, delighted 
because it really shows, as we've been named, um, that we're one of the most caring cities. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, several people come over to Virginia Beach because we're known as being generous. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very key point. I think it's something good to highlight about our city mm -hmm. um, and how caring we are. Mm -hmm. Thank you um, so much for your hard work and in Mr. Freeman's absence, I know he worked um, with you on this as well and your staff certainly do appreciate what you're doing. Um, and I know that it, this will make a difference. Um, and I know that the campaign will be very successful. If there's anything I can do to be a supportive, I'm happy to do that, as you, I'm sure you know. Thank you. Um, I do have one ask for the city manager, um, which I don't want to hinder in any way this program at all, but I do want to focus on the signage for um, the median space. That was, that was an ask that I had specifically. Um, that ask never went away. Um, I do recall when I was getting feedback on it, it was not the most, the feedback I received, it was not the most desirable thing for the city to do. That doesn't mean that we couldn't do it. Um, and, I, and I asked to see what are the potential um, options that we could have for those type of sign it, signs. I noticed they're in Richmond, they're in Chesapeake, and the signs will help in the areas um, where people stand <laughs> by traffic signals in different places. And what, it, what I believe it does in the cities that use them, they see a re reduction in people standing there because people read the sign as they're sitting there um, waiting for the light. They're reading the sign. Um, they're on the cell phone anyway. Um, so they're able to read the sign and they can see, I'm not gonna give to you, I'm gonna give here. This is what I'm supposed to do. And so it will reduce some of that traffic that you see. So that is an ask that I have. I'd like to see um, if and how we can do it um, and what would be some potential signage, um, I guess, examples that we could use because I do think it would be beneficial. Councilmember, when I wasn't aware of that, um, so I'll touch base with mm -hmm. Ruth and Ken and yeah. see what we can do as it relates to that. Yeah, it, that was something back in 2019 that I brought up and with everything that happened, I kind of and kind of went down my list and I kind of forgot about it a little bit. So I, I just had thought about it, but I just wanted to make sure I brought that to your attention Understood. as well. Thank you very much. Okay, anyone else? <coughs> Ruth, once again, thank you thank for you. a spectacular, and you know, the job that you have done for the city over the years is, you know, you have a well-deserved pr promotion and uh, the ship is in good hands. Thank you, sir. And let me just say, a society, a community, a city defines itself mm -hmm. on how it takes care of the underserved. Mm -hmm. And I really think that Virginia Beach, it's ama amazing when you find out with a homeless situation, how many different people mm -hmm. and organizations have to get together to make this work. Mm -hmm. And one of the thing is about Virginia Beach, we're a faith-based community of many faiths. Mm -hmm. A lot of people step into the plate to help out. Um, you know, people don't realize that even throughout the city, we have halfway homes for youth mm -hmm. at risk that are in the, you know, the mm -hmm. system. And we just got a lot of people out there helping. Mm -hmm. But it's nice to know that you're helping and really guiding us and, uh, Looking forward to a new, new JCOH center, you know, sometime within yeah. the future. Yeah. But what we do, you know, what, once again, it's almost never enough. And uh, but once again, it was not through a lack of effort because of people like you. Thank you. Thank and God you, bless sir. You. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Dehaney. All right, Mr. Mayor. The next presentation will be about our rental housing applications process. That's about to be kicked off. We want to bring it to council attention and get any additional feedback and guidance before we roll out with the application process. This is gonna be Mr. David Grisby from the um, housing department. He's the rental housing administrator. Hey, welcome. Hey, thank you. Good to meet all of you.
Is this different think, than what we got in our pack? No, I okay. think he just... Right. I just want to make yeah, sure yeah. I had to read. Oh, you <laughs> said it's additional? Oh, it's, it's, it's not there. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Because I did read all that. Yep. <laughs> all right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm here to talk about um, the Rental Housing Division taking applications for our Housing Choice Voucher Program. Um, I'm going to cover... Uh, first of all, uh, just a quick overview of what the Housing Choice Voucher Program is, how it operates. You got a clicker. You got a clicker. All right. Um, talk about uh, our intention to take applications on Tuesday, November 9th, why we're doing it. And also uh, talk some about the specifics of how the application process works. Um, the Housing Choice Voucher Program, more commonly known as the Section 8 Program, is funded by HUD. Um, almost all of our dollars come from Washington. Only a small number of dollars come from um, the city of Virginia Beach. Um, we only do rental assistance with the Choice Vouchers. We don't own or operate any housing. We're not anybody's landlord. Uh, we don't do any public housing. Uh, under the voucher programs, the participant takes their voucher, they go out on the private market, they select their own unit, and then we pay all or part of the rent, depending on that person's income. Um, we are allotted 2,074 vouchers. So that's a hard limit. We can't serve 2,075 families. Okay. Um, those vouchers are not all housing choice vouchers. Um, we have other programs that count towards that 2074. Uh, there was a program that was passed this spring with the American Rescue Plan called Emergency Housing Vouchers, the EHV vouchers. There's VASH, which is for homeless veterans. We have a number of VASH vouchers. We have um, NED vouchers, which is for non-elderly and disabled. And we also have a fairly new program called Mainstream 5 that make up that 2,074 vouchers. The subsidies for the rent are paid directly to the landlord. We don't pay it to the tenant, and then the tenant goes on and pays it to the landlord. However, for our lowest income families, they also are provided utility assistance. That money is paid directly to the participant to pay their own uh, power bill. So why are we taking applica applications? We last took applications in the year 2012. Uh, when we did, we received almost 14,000 applications. Um, I want you to keep that number in mind because I'm going to come back to it a little bit later. Um, only about a third of the applicants were Virginia Beach residents. So one thing I want to explain about this program is that it's a nationwide program. HUD allocates the vouchers by political subdivision. So we have those 2,074 vouchers for Virginia Beach. So someone from another city can come here and apply and get one of those vouchers. However, if they don't live here, they have to stay here for at least a year before they can move to another jurisdiction. Uh, just in case you wondered why did we have a waiting list where two-thirds of the people didn't live in Virginia Beach. So they do have to lease up here if they're not from Virginia Beach when we call them in to see if they're actually eligible for a voucher. Um, the waiting list that we took in 2012, uh, we project to finish that within five months. So the briefings that we will be doing in March, briefings are when we pull people off the waiting list. They provide all their documentation. Uh, we determine their actual eligibility for the program. When we do that for March, we're going to ha probably have to pull from a new waiting list because we'll be through with the waiting list that we have now. So that's why we're taking applications. So let's talk a little bit about the process. All applications will be taken online. People can use either a computer or a smartphone. This is the same process that we used in 2012. And it's pretty much standard practice for medium and large sized cities to do uh, online only applications for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of which it allows for a seamless transition from people applying to the program to getting on the program. For another, can you imagine 14,000 people showing up at one spot all trying to hand in a paper application? Um, it's going to 
waiting list is going to be open for one day, November 9th. We're going to turn the website on at 7 o'clock in the morning, turn it off at 7 o'clock in the evening. We're going outside of normal business hours so that people who can't get to a device between 8 and 5 for various reasons, maybe they work, they still have an opportunity to apply. When people are on the waiting list, it's not first come, first served. There's no advantage to applying at 7.01 a.m. versus 6.59 p.m. We renumber the applicants after the wait list is closed. And also within that, there are a number of preferences that people get points for so that we make sure we serve certain targeted populations. For example, you get points if you are elderly or disabled. You get points if you are a family with children. You get points for being a veteran. And there's a nine different preferences. Is that federally? No, that that's, that's our discretion. Yes, they're all local preferences. Yes. So, um, why are we taking applications for only one day? Um, the best practice is for uh, PHAs to only have enough people on the waiting list that'll take you three years or less to go through. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for this. One is, if you have a waiting list that's nine years old, you're going to get a lot of upset citizens wondering why they haven't gotten served yet. Um, I'm not the first line for phone calls about people complaining, and I still get probably three phone calls a month of say someone to say, I applied back in 2012. Why haven't you got to me yet? Um, it's an administrative burden to handle that many because when the waiting list is that long, every few years, we purge the waiting list. We send out a letter. It's mostly to check and make sure if people are still at the address they're listed. Um, so the longer the waiting list is, the more staff time that we have to allocate to that. Um, right now, with the waiting list that we have, even though we purged it uh, just under two years ago, we are getting about a 25% hit rate for when we send out letters of people coming back. Uh, another reason to take it for only one day, uh, Mr. Moss stole my thunder a little bit, but uh, Norfolk took applications for just four hours, and they had 11,000 applications. So we feel like uh, 12 hours, with several of them being outside of normal business hours, will get more than enough applicants that will last us more than three years for sure. Um, the other thing I would say is, I want to go back to what I said about there only being 2,074 slots. This is not an entitlement program where everybody that meets the income guidelines gets the assistance. So no matter who's on the waiting list or how long it is, we're going to serve around 2,050 families, 2,070 families every month. And that's the most we can do. So I want to talk about our outreach efforts to try to uh, disseminate the information as widely as possible. We put an ad in the Virginian Pilot and the Daily Press. Uh, that is a HUD mandate. We have to put an ad for three weeks in a newspaper of general circulation. So the ad ran last Saturday. It will run this Saturday, and then it will run the Saturday before we take applications. We're using social media to publicize the taking of applications. Uh, I got an email this morning from Jasmine Chiselski, who's the communications person for DHNP. She just put the stuff on Facebook yesterday morning, and as of late this morning, she already had had 2,504 people mm -hmm. had checked our Facebook page to uh, that particular one about taking applications. So we're pretty confident that it's being widely disseminated. Uh, we have worked with a number of community partners uh, sent them press releases and whatnot. This is not the whole list. This is a partial list, but I think it'll give you an idea of how many different groups we're reaching out to to try to get, um, make sure that everybody uh, is aware that we are taking applications. Uh, one of my concerns was to make sure that there was no population that was excluded. So not everybody is tech savvy, not any everybody has a smartphone or a computer at home. Some people have disabilities that would not allow them to apply online. So the first thing is that we've worked with the public libraries and I want to thank them for being extremely cooperative. Uh, we're announcing that all the Virginia Beach libraries have computers accessible to the public. 
So if, if someone doesn't have a device of their own, they can go to the public library and apply there. To help people that would have difficulty filling out the application, we've chosen five sites, which I've listed, where we will have rental housing staff to answer questions for people who want to know how to fill out the form or help them if, if for example, they're blind or something of that nature, to uh, help them fill it out. Uh, we're in building 18A. Uh, we're not publicizing this, but we're going to have a device in our lobby just in case someone comes to 2424 Courthouse Drive because that's what's listed on our website. You know the parking around here. We don't want to publicize it. We don't really need 100 cars coming into this area, but we will have a device there in case somebody comes by that we will help them to apply there. And uh, some of uh, my staff, they've agreed to work outside their kind of normal business hours to make sure that we're answering the general phone lines from 7 till 7. So uh, we're continuing the public outreach um, and public notice campaign. And uh, I'm here, a brief in the city council. Does anybody have any questions? Any questions? Looks like a good okay. plan. Mr. Rouse. Thank you so much. Um, I didn't catch your name again. I'm sorry. David Grigsby. David, thank you, David, um, for the presentation. I just have a couple questions. I myself uh, grew up um, in my early childhood in North of Virginia in a place called Young's Park. Um, that's what we called it back then. It's called Young Terrace today. Um, it's in the St. Paul's Quadrant, a place where they're actually turning down the community um, and put up affordable housing. And they're giving the community residents housing vouchers. Um, but one of the big issues with those housing vouchers is not landlords, private landlords, not everyone accept those housing vouchers. And so my question to you is, is when we open up the housing voucher um, waiting list for one day on November 9th, and you say at the end of we have a campaign, we have community housing um, we have partners um, to make sure the public outreach and notice of that campaign. Are we also working um, within the city of Virginia Beach to change the perception of what these housing vouchers are? Because landlords hear Section 8 and they go, well, we don't want to touch anybody who has a housing voucher or a Section 8 voucher. And that's a, a really a big issue. We can, they can get a, a voucher, but that voucher isn't, isn't accepted everywhere. So what are we doing to help change um, the narrative and the perception around these housing vouchers? So uh, I've been working this job for just under two years. And so I was here about five months when COVID hit. And that was followed very quickly by the eviction moratoriums. And that dramatically changed the whole equation for everything. So as far as landlords not accepting the voucher, as of July 1st, 2020, in the state of Virginia, people getting housing assistance are protected class. So as long as someone owns, I'm trying to remember whether it's four or more units or more than four units, but a small time landlord this doesn't apply to it in an apartment complex cannot discriminate against somebody based on their source of income. So if it's an apartment complex or a management company that has multiple properties, they are in violation of fair housing laws if they turn down people solely based on Section 8. And, and, and that's, that's good to know. I know there's, there's certain limitations on how far, you know, um, the laws can go. I mean, if there's a private, if there's a property owner who owns a, a condo or a townhome, mm -hmm. I mean, they have the right to, to rent to whomever they want to, uh, I guess. So my question is, are, are we also um, finding ways to um, tear down the perception or change the perception yeah. that these housing vouchers or Section 8 mm -hmm. vouchers are only given to people who aren't all aren't great um, tenants so to speak so are, are we saying you know to landlords hey this is you know stable income because obviously mm -hmm. the city yeah. is a partner in this but also these are families um as as well who are who are great tenants are we what are we doing to build up that campaign and to change that narrative okay so um before i, I get directly to that one thing i want to talk about is that because there's an extreme nationwide and in our community shortage of rental units, which has been probably exacerbated by the eviction moratorium. Mm -hmm. uh, landlords are raising rents more than the inflation rate. 
So there's something that HUD sets called the fair market rent. Mm -hmm. And we, you can go above that. It's called a payment standard. I'm not going to get too much in the weeds, but there are probably a lot of units that they won't accept the Section 8 voucher because the rent is too high at that unit based on what HUD is willing to pay. Okay. okay. To talk about the perception issue. So uh, a few months back, because our voucher holders, we noticed, were taking an extremely long time to find units, longer than they had been when we mm -hmm. benchmarked it to a year before, <laughs> also a higher percentage of them were not able to find units. Mm -hmm. Um, we hired a housing locator whose job is to uh, call apartment complexes, go to Zillow.com, um, drive around looking for uh, for rent signs and things like that and make contact. So that's one thing we've done. Uh, we have uh, a landlord outreach team that's been working on that. Um, we did have an event. Uh, it's been a while since we had that event. We'll probably have another one this coming spring, make it kind of an annual thing. Uh, what you mentioned about Section 8 tenants being good tenants, yes, there's a study um, that, that I have saved on my OneDrive mm -hmm. that talks about, there's actually two different studies, and they do say Section 8 tenants stay longer. If it's a certain class of housing, mm -hmm. which is for moderate income people, mm -hmm. Section 8 tenants stay longer than non-Section 8 tenants. Mm -hmm. um, they pay their rent more because if you have somebody that's of moderate income, if their income goes down and you're the landlord, you're kind of out of luck. But with Section 8, as long as they report their loss of income to us, then our part of the rent goes up. We cover that. And I think a lot of landlords, because of COVID and the eviction moratoriums, people losing their jobs in retail, for example, couldn't pay the rent. I, I think that's raised the perception of our tenants because they know, the landlords know, that the subsidy will cover any loss of income. So it, it's a hard road to hoe because there's just – an extreme, extreme lack of vacancies of any mm -hmm. kind, of any kind. I've talked to different landlord groups. Mm -hmm. They're talking about 98 to 99 percent occupancy rates being normal. I've heard many anecdotes of our voucher holders calling somebody the day after a notice that a unit's available. Uh, we already got five applications for that unit. For that unit, it's a real problem. Sure. Um, until something happens with that housing shortage. I think there's only so much we can do. But the main point is, if you ever hear about that, that is a violation of fair housing law based on uh, people with um, vouchers being a protected class. You cannot discriminate based on source of income. So you probably should, if you hear somebody like that from your community, you should probably tell them to discuss that with legal aid. Yeah. Well, I will you know, offer my help. Um, we have that event um, in the spring to, mm -hmm. to really, if we can uh, build a campaign around, you know, updating and educating um, the landlords on exactly what Section um, 8 is and housing vouchers is, I think there's a, so there's a bunch of misconceptions about the, the people who tend to have housing vouchers in Section 8 and, ten, and what they uh, tend to, to live like. So I would like to help mm -hmm. dismantle that as well. Um, my, my last question for you, and I just need for, further clarification. Can you explain to me again, you said one-third or two-thirds of the housing vouchers are people who live outside of? That was the applet, the people who applied. Okay. Yes, everybody that has our voucher does live in Virginia Beach. That's okay. of the people who applied. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you receive a housing voucher, do you, do you have to have the housing voucher? It has to be within our city because it's... If you live in Virginia Beach when you apply and you're, you live in Virginia Beach when your name comes up on the waiting list and you've lived here for at least a year, okay. then you can port it out. It's, when someone moves, it's a nationwide program. It's like if you're a veteran and you move from Norfolk to Fayetteville, North Carolina, you just go to a different VA hospital. Oh, right. That's how the voucher program works. It's called portability. The thing is you can't do what I call an instaport. You can't instantly take a – you can't live in Chesapeake, take our voucher, and move right to Chesapeake. Okay. Uh, but if you live in Virginia Beach, you could take it. I want to mention, uh, circle back to what you said about what's going on. You're probably talking about what's called RAD, mm -hmm. which is the conversion of public housing to vouchers. Mm -hmm. And so that's happening a lot around the country, and I know it's happened in a couple of uh, our sister communities. Mm -hmm. So we've had a lot of people pouring in because they were in public housing. They were given a voucher. They couldn't find a unit where they lived, mm -hmm. so they're hoping they can find a unit in Virginia Beach. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. Just one quick one, Mr. Grigsby. Okay. Um, how long? John. Okay, I'm sorry. 
How long uh, does a voucher, how long does it last? You mean once you have the voucher? Right. It's a life, as long as you don't mess up. Once you get one, yes. you got it. Yes. Okay. Okay, Mr. Mr. Moss and Ms. Wilkerson. I just want to come back to clarify, do we have 2,074 vouchers that represent an entitlement to a source of funding, or is there a specific defined grant that we receive monetarily that you then compute and say that equals 2,074 units? It's both. It's both. We, we get a dollar amount that we can't go over and a, a 2,074 is the voucher limit. Right now, because of our per unit cost, we only serve about 2,050 families. Because mm -hmm. if we served another 20 families, we'd be spending more money than we're getting. So the money is the constraining limit? For us, under current conditions, yes. Okay. My follow-on question, you mentioned the Main Street program, and I don't know if that's the program that my knowledge is, but I know that there are housing programs, I'm not sure it's Section 8, but where HUD permits a bigger amount to be paid to place people in normally in uh, apartments of an income nature that they normally a voucher program would get. This is back to the getting more integrated communities. Is that the Main Street program? Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to, I just, I've, I can't remember what the name of that program was, and I didn't know if that Section 8 was encompassed in that program. So we administer two programs that are funded by Virginia State taxpayers. One's called SRAP and one's called SMI. SRAP is for citizens with intellectual and developmental disabilities. SMI is for people with severe mental illnesses. And recently, they have realized that with the amount of their vouchers, their people can't find units, so they have uh, put forth a proposal to go to, I hope I don't, don't bore you here, go to 130% of the fair market rent, whereas we're at 110%, go to 130% of the fair market rent, so a person with a one-bedroom voucher has more money to look for a unit. But that isn't, what you're talking about um, is uh, when, when they try to spread people out throughout a city and not tie people with low incomes to the low income section of town. Correct. Right. So that's where we can designate certain zip codes as places with higher rents and go for a higher payment standard, which you, like a week ago, maybe, we finally got permission from HUD to do that. So we're going to designate certain zip codes where people can go to 120% of the fair market rent, whereas the rest of the city is 110%. The reason why I mention that, if I continue, it's because most of the new production of housing mm -hmm. is at the very highest end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And because there's no I'm margin mm -hmm. other than tax credit, which is yeah. constrained allocation. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at some of these things, there isn't any way to create inventory under the current tax policy, and no one's going to build apartments to lose money. So I was just curious if we were taking advantage of that. And thank you very much for the explanation, and I was not the least bit bored. Okay. If, if I could follow up with John's point, just to, I just need further, a little bit of clarification. If you go to a, a higher market rate percentage, you know, if we're at 120 percent of the market rate, uh, which means you're going to be paying a higher, um, uh, higher rent or, or subsidy, does that then decrease the overall 274 um, vouchers because you're taking away from that, 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 that solid number? So it's like we can do, yes. so, do more, but you have to bring it less. with less, <laughs> okay. right? So one thing we did fairly recently is we had a very strict what's called occupancy standard, which was two heartbeats, one bedroom. Mm -hmm. That means an adult parent with a 17-year-old child was given a one-bedroom voucher. Um, this, I think, as I understand it, this is before my time, this was put in during sequestration when every dollar was tight and we were trying to not kick people off the program for lack of dollars. But anyway, that, ha that has persisted all this time. So we changed the occupancy standard and we know that's going to increase. We did some projections. Mm -hmm. That's going to increase our per unit cost. Mm -hmm. In the case of what you're suggesting is called small area fair market rent. Mm -hmm. It has to cover 50% or less of your population. It can't be the whole city. Mm -hmm small area we do project it's going to cost us more money mm -hmm. but we feel like we can cover it okay. we, we did some projections we, we feel like we can cover it we're going to monitor it as things go okay yeah all right thank you so much okay Ms. yes good afternoon and thank you for your presentation it's very informative uh, I just wanted to make note of an observation 
Um, generally, when we look at promoting and doing outreach on programs that are as essential as this, I always like to see um, if we're reaching out to the faith-based communities and to nonprofits. And I was pleased to see that you had that in your presentation that you considered and reached out to the faith-based community and nonprofits. So just want to say thank okay. you for doing that and being inclusive in that regard. Okay. Anyone else? Big problem. Hey, once again, thank you for the great work you folks are doing. Much needed. Thank All right. You. Thanks for your time. And Mr. Rouse, I'll be calling you in the spring. All right. I look forward thank to you. it. Okay. Mr. Dehaney. Mr. Mayor, member of council, at this time, Bobby Tahan and the planning team will give you a planning glimpse on the pending planning items. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Carolyn Smith, and we have five planning items scheduled for you on November 9th, and you will get a bit of a rep reprieve in November as we have zero planning items for you on that second meeting of November 16th. So the meetings on the 9th, or the applications on the 9th include the design guidelines that were deferred related to corporate landing business park. We also have two land use applications and then two conditional use permit applications for short-term rentals. And just to quickly refresh your memory, item one was, is a request of the development authority to update the design criteria for a portion of the corporate landing business park. And based on direction from the city council, both the design guidelines and the proffer agreement have been readjusted to reflect that existing buffer width of 75 feet for properties adjacent to residential and then also along General Booth Boulevard. So you will see, again, some revised documents in your Friday package that reflect that. And their website is also being updated to reflect those changes. City Council has been briefed on that several times, so I'll just go ahead and move on to item number two, if that's okay. So application two is a request for a conditional use permit for auto storage, excuse me, auto, automobile service station at the intersection of Newtown and Princess Anne Roads in the Newtown SGA. This is a 1.39 acre site and a 4,600 square foot convenience store with fueling stations is proposed. A portion of the site was previously occupied by a BP gas station and they also offered auto repair. With this request, auto repair is not a component. There's an existing office, office building on the site as well that will be demolished in order to fit all of the proposed improvements on this site. So highlights of this application include the removal of three of the five existing vehicular ingress egress points along the rights of way. So that will be a safety improvement as it, this uh, reflects a, re, a reduction in the number of conflict points. A new right turn lane will also be installed along Princess Anne Road. And landscaping features on the site include two foot tall berms with plantings at the intersection and along Newtown Road. There were two speakers at the Planning Commission public hearing who were in opposition. They own units in the adjacent office complex to the east and they had concerns related to the site layout design, vehicular ingress egress, as well as screening. So to aid in alleviating their concerns, the Planning Commission has recommended an additional condi condition <coughs> that would require the installation of a privacy fence along their shared property line, which is the eastern property line on that screen on the left, that top graphic on the left. And that fence would be at least six feet tall. It would be a solid white all-weather uh, vinyl fence. And also that any plants along that property line be required to be maintained at a height of 10 feet. So the Planning Commission, with that added condition, recommends approval with a vote of 10 to 0. Item number three is a request for a conditional use permit for a craft distillery within a shopping center 
along Oceana Boulevard, and City Council recently approved an expansion for a craft brewery also in this shopping center just several months ago. And that craft brewery has been operating on this property since 2019 without any incident. The almost 7,000 square foot craft distillery proposes to produce and sell vodka. And their label, which is Beach Vodka, while marketed and sold throughout the area, is actually produced in other states. So approval of this application would bring their production into Virginia and then specifically into Virginia Beach. Staff did receive one letter of opposition from a nearby resident who uh, just has general objections to alcohol and craft distilleries and craft breweries. And she also noted concerns related to traffic in the vicinity. As this was, um, as the, uh, there were no speakers at the Planning Commission's public hearing, Planning Commission did place this on their consent agenda recommending approval. And then the next and last two applications are for, for conditional use permits for short-term rentals in the same condominium development at the oceanfront known as Retreat by the Sea. In fact, City Council has approved six conditional use permits for short-term rentals on this property. Items four and five are within the 900 block of Pacific Avenue and are zoned Oceanfront Resort District Form Base Code. Item four is specifically a two bedroom unit where parking spaces, where two parking spaces are required. And in this condominium development, each unit is only assigned one parking space. So to address that one space deficiency, they have contacted the 9th Street parking garage and it is their intent to lease the space in that garage, which is immediately to the south of the site across 9th Street. Based on information found on the host compliance website, this unit has never been advertised, it's not recently advertised, and no complaints have been registered with the zoning office and staff is not aware of any opposition. And item five is a one bedroom unit, again in that same apartment or condominium complex. And that one bedroom unit only requires one parking space which can be met on site. And similarly to the last application, according to the host compliance website, the unit has not been advertised. It's not currently advertised. No complaints have been registered and there is no known opposition. And that would be a wrap for November for you. Oh, thank you. Any questions? Mr. Tower. Just one, <clears throat> Ms. Smith, thanks. Um, the illustration, <clears throat> for example, on page 12 um, that I'm looking at. <clears throat> oh, I see. It shows through there, but not on the printed version. Yes, okay. sir. I, was, I noticed I was that confused. mistake, so we've made that adjustment. Sorry about that. Got it. Okay. Thank you. You have good eyes. I see, I see, I see what you've done. <laughs> I see what you're doing. Yeah, right. thank you. Hey, anyone else? Okay, Ms. Henley. Uh, I have a uh, comment about an issue that uh, Carolyn Smith briefed us on on October 27th of 2020, a year ago tomorrow. And that was the proposal uh, relating to enhancing public engagement uh, in uh, rezonings and use permits having to do with infill development and redevelopment. Uh, we came up, or we, we had a committee. Uh, we, we were developing a, a council policy and so forth for enhancing public engagement and it just kind of uh, ran out of steam at that point. But it was brought to our attention by a uh, Civic League president at our meeting last week, and he suggested that we might want to uh, look at this again, particularly as they were related. He thought it was a good policy proposal, and particularly as it related to the, uh, the issue that was withdrawn last week, they would really like to follow up. So I would just ask council if we could dust this off and bring it back up and look at it again because I think these these redevelopment and infill parcels are going to continue 
and uh, I think there were some good things here that maybe we want to look at again. So if I could ask that we kind of put it back on the table. I know that you did a lot of work on it a year ago, and I think we were getting, getting some good comments. And, and I think it's going to be something we really need to pursue. Surely. And I, I will say we do um, highly recommend that our applicants use many of those tactics that we came up with, most of which are not required. But you'll see that when we present up here, we'll say they've created a website and, and so things like that. So I think the message is yeah, slowly getting out some there. Some of these things have been being done. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I think if we, we follow through on this, that it will help us out so that we don't get in these situations of just total gridlock. Right. And I know the city manager's office has been doing quite a bit of research. Yeah. So it's certainly a team effort that's going on. It's not just me by any means, but. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Moving on, Mr. DeHaney. Mr. Mayor, members of council, at this time, the budget director, Kevin Chatelier, would um, engage council in a budget guidance presentation to kind of show council where we're going towards as we prepare the budget. Welcome, Kev. Good evening, Mayor, members of council. Uh, as the city manager just said, uh, today's the purpose of today's briefing is to engage council and seek input and guidance as we kick off the FY23 budget process. Uh, we began the seeking city council input guidance, excuse me, on the front end of the budget process really last year. Um, unfortunately, due to the timing, council agenda, we weren't able to really engage council until December last year. So this year we're looking to do it much earlier in the budget process. As members of council are aware, the budget process is really pretty much a year round process. Um, you can see here by this slide, we're at the beginning of the budget process with the gray box. There will be plenty of opportunities for city council to continue to um, have conversation, discussions about the upcoming budget process as we go through this, including next month with the uh, five-year forecast where we'll be providing city council with a more in-depth look in numbers, and revenues, and the projected expenditures and trend lines. Uh, also, what we'll be looking to do is historically city council has had a mid-year retreat. Should city council have that, we'd also look to uh, engage city council at that point in time if they would like to uh, have a meeting or additional briefings as they're making budget discussions or having those deliberations. Um, before jumping into the actual guidance, and as city manager said, where we're leaning towards as we kick this off, uh, I'd like to give a quick um, kind of 360 review of how we compare to other uh, Hampton Roads localities here in terms of some of our larger tax rates. As you can see by this slide, Virginia Beach has the lowest tax rate with, compared to the Hampton Roads localities at 99 cents per $100 assessed value. Something that's important to note is should City Council go forward with the, if the referendum's approved and City Council goes forward with the adoption of the plan to increase real estate tax 4.3 cents to service those bonds over a 20-year term, City, Virginia Beach would still have the lowest tax rate within the region uh, to be followed by Chesapeake as the second lowest. Looking at the next largest local revenue source for Virginia Beach, personal property tax. You can see on this slide, Virginia Beach remains the lowest at $4 per $100 assessed value. Looking at the hotel tax, you can see here that Virginia Beach is in line with all the other Hampton Roads localities being 8%. Something that's important to note is what's reflected here is the 8% that's taxed and collected and retained by each locality. This does not reflect the 1% tax that the state just recently implemented um, to the Hampton Roads localities for all of them to apply to their hotel transit occupants. <coughs> so that's why you see here 8% as opposed to the 9% that they actually might be taxing. Meals tax, Virginia Beach is tied for the lowest in the region with Chesapeake at 5.5%. And looking at emission tax, Virginia Beach is in line with all the other Hampton Roads localities at 10%. <coughs> and looking at the stormwater ERU rate, each locality does a little bit differently. Virginia Beach's current rates are 49.3 cents per day, and some of the other localities charge a fee per month. So to normalize that, we put that on this um, the visual here on a 
per month basis. And you can see Virginia Beach has the highest ERU rate um, when compared to the other Hampton Roads localities. It's not a surprise though, as Virginia Beach has um, made stormwater their number one priority in recent years and city council's made a lot of initiatives to address the maintenance and stormwater needs of the city. And they've done that primarily through the ERU, which has been the primary financing um, means of financing for stormwater needs. Also a quick visual in comparison of trash collection fee. As you can see here, Virginia Beach is the second lowest within the region. Um, that's first lowest being Chesapeake, who effectively has no trash collection fee that they charge as they provide these services through their general fund resources. Virginia Beach's fee is $25, which is the next lowest per month, which is the next lowest fee in the region. Uh, switching over to seeking budget guidance now, um, start by talking really quickly about the revenues. Um, as we're beginning the budget process, we're going into this with the mindset that we're not looking to have tax increases on um, the tax rates we were just talking about. So no general government tax increases to support the baseline operations. We'll also be looking to continue City Council's previously adopted policies related to uh, revenue tax dedications such as the TIP, TAP, ARP, open space. We'd be looking to maintain those until otherwise directed by Council to look elsewhere. Um, also something we're looking to do is uh, to potentially um, be allowed the consideration to offset some programmatic fees uh, related to, or excuse me, increase, potentially increase programmatic fees to offset increased costs in some programs and services. A good example of this could be um, the impacts of the minimum wage increase and what those might have on certain programs and services, in particular within Parks and Rec. Other considerations as we uh, begin the budget process is to look at the enterprise fund revenues, uh, something that will be important to look at and monitor over the course of the budget process, especially pending the outcome of the upcoming referendum will be the stormwater fee and the ERU and ensure that we have the right balance of prioritization of the projects and maintenance and capital needs within that can be maximized and fully funded by the ERU fee. Um, also, something else that we're going to be mindful of is the waste management fee. Uh, City Council was briefed a few weeks ago on the potential increase in SIPSA tipping fees and the, how that might have an impact on services and delivery. Uh, and will the waste management fund be able to absorb that? That's something we're going to be looking at over the course of the budget process. What we're going to be mindful of is attempting not to necessarily increase the waste collection fee for a one time increase. However, we do also want to be mindful that the waste collection fee does properly sustainly, sustainably finance and fund all the waste management needs and operations, including vehicle replacement um, and other contractual operations. And looking at baseline expenditures, one of the things we're going to be looking to do is try to maintain and preserve baseline operations as best we can while also trying to be mindful of inflation and how that might be a real impact in the upcoming budget process. Uh, we'll be looking to provide departments with some level of flexibility to try to address it. Um, if they're unable to absorb certain increases, then we would look to potentially have a, a either a set aside or reserve, or we'd like to work with them and provide them the ability to maintain current services and things not be pushed out as a result of inflation. Also, <clears throat> as always, we like to work with departments um, and be open-minded to providing additional consideration to services that might have cost-saving features or efficiency factors. And looking at the CIP, as we begin the budget process, something we like to do or we're looking to do is begin the baseline CIP discussion based on the adopted 21 CIP. So the year one of the CIP is appropriated each year with five years of planned program funding in the out years. Basically, as we kick off the budget process, we like to slide those forward and that becomes, becomes the starting point of discussion with section managers. Something that we are trying to be mindful of this year are the impacts of inflation on construction costs. And we're looking to work with section managers very closely to ensure that we allow for construction costs or construction schedules to not be impacted or delayed as a result of this. And we're going to try to preserve those construction timelines as best we can. Something else that became a, 
um, topic of discussion with city council last year was city city schools use of PFRBs within their CIP finance, means of financing. We've learned from schools that they are looking to continue this practice going forward in their submitted FY23 CIP. So that would result in an additional $15 million being requested by schools in year six of the CIP. Certainly something we would like to do is be mindful of this, especially pending the outcome of the bond <coughs> referendum. And as PFRBs will have an impact on the city's debt metrics, and we share those with schools, we would need to be mindful of that and what that might have on those. So we would certainly keep city council aware if this did have a negative impact on that. And then obviously, um, pending the outcome of the stormwater referendum, uh, we would be mindful of looking to potentially reprioritize existing projects within the stormwater CIP to ensure we're maximizing the ERE revenue. Uh, <clears throat> so city council received a briefing a couple of weeks ago from various directors within the city of Virginia Beach about how they're experiencing several vacancies and hard to fill positions and the impact of services that's having. That's something we're looking to be mindful of as we begin this budget process and we're going to be mindful of as we work throughout this budget process. So some potential strategies to mitigate that uh, will be to potentially have a set aside at the beginning of the budget process of about 3% compensation reserve. Um, how that's allocated will be yet, is yet to be determined. Um, obviously, there's several factors at play. One, we have a market salary survey currently underway, and we don't know what the outcome of that is. Uh, also, in the past, 3% set aside has typically gone across the board as either a merit or cost of living adjustment. Um, we would look towards the findings of market salary survey and direction from council as to how to best move forward with that. But to start the budget process, we would like to have a 3% set aside. Also, other considerations as we work throughout the budget process will be a review of the fringe benefit offerings uh, that the city has. We would like to work with HR and the departments to get their input and feedback on their ideas and what they feel like might help them be more effective in attracting or recruiting talent. Some other areas of focus and consideration could be the uh, repurposing of long-term vacancies. The city manager's made it clear as we've begun the budget process to directors that he is going to want to give a hard look at long-term vacancies. And prior to adding new FTEs for initiatives throughout the city, he's going to be looking to repurpose those long-term vacancies to remain as budget neutral as possible. Some of the potential consideration for the redirection of those FTEs could be for uh, an additional BMP inspection crew. City Council previously had expressed some interest in looking at potentially looking at the inspection of private BMPs. Obviously, this is something we would need to work with Public Works to flush out, but we could do that certainly as part of the operating budget process. If City Council determines that FTEs are a need for the Citizen Review Panel to staff that, that's certainly another area where redirection of long-term vacancies could be utilized. Currently, you all heard it a couple of weeks ago that EMS is experiencing a decline in their volunteerism. Should this decline continue to adequate, adequately staff ambulances, there could be a need to professionalize some EMS staff. City manager is given direction that he would like to look to use long-term vacancies as a first option to address that need as opposed to just adding new FTEs to the operating budget and their, their, them having an operating budget impact cost. Also, something to consider is we still have further work to do on the implementation of the Hillard Hines recommendations. Uh, there's additional staffing needs in HR, as well as recommendations for needs of the office of, or security office within emergency management. City managers indicated that prior to adding new FDs, he would like to explore the use of long-term vacancies for those needs as well. Um, also, some consideration we'd like to give towards a review of the regional grant commitments. Uh, the upcoming budget process will provide a good opportunity for that as we have some of those master agreements near the end of their term and use or life. So we would be able to explore that and like to engage city council on additional briefings on get some guidance and direction of what they would, if they would like for us to continue to pursue some of those initiatives. So in addition to the guidance on the allocation of resources throughout the budget process, we'd also like to seek City Council's guidance and input on the format of the briefings that they receive. 
as a result of the pandemic and limited space, we have not been able to give briefings to city council the last couple of years like we did in prior years to where every director and every section manager comes up and gives a comprehensive review and overview to, for city council's discussion and consideration. So perhaps today as part of the conversation, we could get that guidance and input and we can certainly accommodate whether city council would like to have that approach or if they would like an abbreviated approach to those presentations. Other things that we would like to have and staff intends to bring back for city council's additional consideration are a uh, discussion of the market salary survey and compensation, the COG process or the community organization grant process, as well as the micro grant process. And then obviously a follow up to one of the previous briefings on um, how to best address the vacancy issue that the city's facing. <clears throat> this next slide is just a quick timeline. Um, budget recap of the uh, overall budget process. As I said, it's really a year-round process and something city council, city council is very familiar with. <clears throat> and with that, really just like turn it over to council and step back and receive guidance, feedback, input on the direction of, as we kick off the starting point of the operating budget process on revenues, expenditures, areas of focus, consideration, um, budget format, presentations, briefing format, and any feedback council would like to give so we can hopefully deliver a budget that meets your all's needs and the expectations of the public. Okay, if I can make a, a quick comment. Um, you know, Kevin, I think given the fact we have a couple new council members and uh, Mrs. Henley and some other folk, uh, we may want to go back to, you know, maybe the more fuller briefings, especially now that we can, uh, you know, do it. I know sometimes it's uh, as Mr. Moss adequately puts death by PowerPoint, but uh, but given some of the challenges uh, you know that we have, and it's certainly you know the results of the referendum are going to go to a very very long way into ultimately shaping you know, you know the budget you know with CIPs and everything. So, but once again, thank you for your thing, and I will op we'll open up the questions now, Mr. Moss. Well, I won't repeat everything that's in my letter, but I'm going to post that this evening. I have, and I know the city manager and have kind of copied my, my thoughts, but I would like to go to slide 10 if I could, please, Kevin. Yes, sir. And what a pleasure it is to work with your office, I might add. Just a great, I enjoy all the conversations. Thank you. Um, assume general tax rate increases support. This is the key, doesn't assume any tax rate increases, but the rate at 0.9887 when we're looking to potentially double digit 15 to 20 percent increases in the overall valuations if we meet the national average and i know at the five-year forecast we're supposed to get a sample from the tax successor of what we're really going to see a book value so if we see book value go up by 10 percent i think you're right we're not going to assume any increase in the rate but as i suggest in my letter to my peers i think we should start at the revenue neutral rate and then raise the rate by 3% as the starting point to accommodate what other people are experiencing in their, their personal income so that we don't keep the rate at 0.9887 if the tax base goes up 15%. That is a huge inflationary windfall to the government that comes at the expense of residents, which didn't see a 15% increase in their pay. So I think we need to be mindful of keeping the rate the same. And that goes later for personal property tax. Uh, the average used car appreciation September to September is 24.2%. That's just been reported uh, yesterday. And so that's a substantial increase over and above what you would expect under normal operations, more than what our five-year forecast last November was forecasted on. So again, there's a windfall of revenue benefit that has a big regressive impact on, on our less income fortunate uh, residents. So I think we have to be mindful uh, of, of that. Uh, I think on fees, I think the extent that we can transfer the cost of the service, that is the right approach. I think we need to make sure that we understand that some of the things that we're trying to provide services to some of our more uh, less fortunate folks, we need to find out what that is and we're not charging that off to other people. The general fund should absorb that. I don't think we should be asking people to, to use the facilities to subsidize other people that are using it because of a policy that we've adopted for free or reduced rate. I think, Mr. Mayor, that's a general fund obligation. We just need to know what it is and know where it fits. Could you go to slide uh, 13? 
Um, two things here. One, I, I think we need to take a hard look, and I would like to know, and I think we need to have a separate discussion on debt service itself and allocation both for our own needs and, and schools. And certainly if the referendum passes, that $15 million is probably less likely. I think that we all probably know that, and let's hope it does pass. I just want to point out that that is uh, a need, especially when we look at the ending fund balance, and probably the ending fund balance should be a bullet on this slide, because often we think of the ending fund balance as a place to meet capital uh, expenditures. So if the schools have a substantial ending fund balance, maybe they can put that $15 million in year one of the budget and shift out their borrowing capacity to year six. Therefore, their net borrowing is net zero, but they have $15 million that they're looking for. I don't think we can assess the CIP, capital investments, out of context with the ending fund balance of either the city and the schools. Uh, if you could, oh, and also, is this where VRS is? No, that's another slide. No. Could you go to the, uh, where VRS is? I can't remember which slide that was. Yes, I do know that we have not been keeping pace <laughs> with the backup payments to really meet the glide path. We started back when we said we we're going to retire the deficit over 30 years. Well, the deficit, I know the manager has been growing faster than the back than the restoration payments. So I would, I think we need to know what that is and what is the cost of keeping to the original timeline we adopted, which was to retire the original deficit. And do we understand the root cause of why, despite the catch-up payments, the outstanding balance continues to grow? Because that would tend to suggest it's underperformance, but lately that's not been the case. So it must be that we're not putting enough in for the current payrolls that we have. But I just want to understand that so that the council understands what's the cost drivers of that delta and what's the implications if we don't address that gap. In, in terms of the timeline, we're, we will be knowing what the city's VRS rate will be for the FY23 process in November. So we would be able to provide that information as to what the it will be set and known at that point in time, and we should have a better sense of what the actuarial and the glide path will look like at the state level. Correct. But a part is it's been growing each cycle despite our backup, our catch-up payments, which means either one is underperformance, which hasn't been the case for the last two cycles, or it's that the amount that we're paying on the payroll of that year hasn't been sufficient to meet the actuarial requirement. I don't know what it is, but that gap is growing and that shouldn't be the case. I'd just like to understand why that is. Could you go to slide 16, yes, please? Uh, I applaud you on the reply of vacancies. I have looked at that myself. That is a, always the first pay. I would hope on these private BNP inspections, we're also looking at a private sector alternative to performing that function. Maybe they could be bonded, and then when they don't do a good job, we can have recourse to make them pay for the restoration that wasn't done correctly. So that might be the best <coughs> way to deal with that. Uh, I think we have to fully fund the citizen review panel, however we decide what that requirement is. And I know that we haven't settled out on that, but I think that the public expects us to deal with that. Um, I need to have more information than we all will on the EMS thing. That's, I'm sure there's work to come. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we we got to look at the Hillard Hines recommendations to see what, which of that we do. It's definitely on security, that's very important. Uh, regional grants, I think that's long overdue for a zero sum, a zero base review of those things as to the value added. And if you, I think the schedule was the last thing I believe. Or no, go one more back. I will d defer to the the managers and other council members' request. Uh, you might not see me at all those death by PowerPoint presentations. I can I can read for myself, but I don't want to deny anyone the opportunity who enjoys those. Um, but I, I do think that when you talked here, I think we made it back on CIP that try to maintain the schedule as much as possible. But one of the things I point out is we can't look at our budget as it's in a vacuum. And I know you don't, Kevin. I'm not suggesting that you do. But we can't say that we insulate ourselves from schedule risk, and in return we have to raise taxes on people who don't have an option. So I think there's a trade space for risk. I know that's not something that we have traditionally done in our budget practices, but there is a trade-off and risk analysis. And one of the things I mentioned, since we're all about, and Mr. Mayor, I'm with you in terms of, is our CIP uh, got the right balance if we're trying to maximize our opportunity to attract and diversify our tax base? 
So maybe there's things that we were going to do, but if our thought process was what strategic investments would we make if we're trying to line up with Taylor's strategy to grow and attract businesses, we might want to defer a road over here to do this road here. So I, I think if one of our objectives of our resource thing <coughs> is to increase our opportunities to grow revenues, both for investment, that we need to make sure our CIP is helping us do that. It's going to have a cost because I know we're shuffling the cards around. And also, how do we go about creating a fund that I mentioned this also in my letter that the city manager has, but coming back to this, that gives Taylor the ability to know that we have the dollars, we not have to go and look for them, but to make a quick deal if it's the right deal that we can act precipitously, I think that's the right word, I hope, <laughs> but quickly to make that work because we got the cash on hand and we can make those. So I, I think we got to, does our CIP really facilitate and enable our economic development strategy? I, I think today the CIP doesn't really do that in a, in a way that puts the manager and maybe and Taylor and that to bring stuff back to us to make a quick decision and we have the money. Um, strategy of vacancies, I think this gets back to the larger issue of in today's environment, parity is not a policy that allows us to be responsive to the needs to fill the positions. We are going to have to be much more tactical and I think the council will take a lot of heat departing from parity for parity's sake but we've got to we've got to have policies that allow us to effectively do our mission and uh, parity is not a policy that allows us to do that that's just my personal opinion but anyway i i'd like to discuss this later i know you all have sure. a chance to read and digest this but i did want to hit the highlights thank you very much no thank you john just one okay, quick anybody one. else yeah mr branch and then Ms. Wolf. thank you uh mayor kevin uh, these two big bills up in congress right now uh the infrastructure and this other one have you had a chance to think what might be coming to our city if one or both of those pass? I mean, do you have any idea? In terms of a dollar amount? No, I don't, I don't know how it's going to shake out in terms of what buckets will be available for us to apply or to seek out. I don't know if it will come down in the manner that the, the relief did previously. I don't know if it will be driven by a formula or if it will be in separate buckets that we then need to go out and pursue and apply for. I suspect the latter but I don't know exactly yet. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wilber. Thank you so much for your presentation. Very thorough. Uh, my comments are more so for my colleagues. Um, I just want to make sure that I start off um, this budget process the right way. Um, I want to thank my colleagues for listening to uh, my request uh, regarding uh, a Centerville District Rec Center last year. Um, and I did, I took notes and on your feedback, and I appreciate the feedback that you gave me, um, one of which was to start early. Hence, I'm starting early during the budget process um, to ask for your consideration for funding um, some um, part of the rec recreational center uh, for the Centerville District. Uh, this is a continued ask for the citizens and residents in that district. Um, another feedback point or element I wrote down um, was that several people said, wait until the upcoming budget 2022. Um, and then there are others who also said, we need the information, the study, provide that information to us. I believe I provided the information to most of you, but if I haven't, Please let me know and I'm happy to provide that information to you. Um, but I would certainly just like to ask for your consideration early on for the uh, rec center, the funding, um, if not all, some portion, um, because unless we're intentional in doing it um, and have a plan, it's not going to get done. So uh, that is my ask. I will continue and review the rest of the elements of the budget uh, very thoroughly. And I will certainly come back with some other feedback uh, as well. Uh, but I do want to make sure I put that on the table for my colleagues' consideration. Thank you in advance. OK, uh, thank you, Ms. Henley. Well, I appreciate the mayor uh, remembering that I was one of the folks that said I wanted the detail in the budget. And I, I understand Mr. Moss uh, has the uh, uh, ability to read and 
for himself, and I do too, but these presentations give me insight into what each division, what department feels is important. And to me, I need that in, in helping to determine whether or not we're on the right track. Plus, it also gives the public a chance to see how we're proposing to spend their money and what the needs are. And I know in, in some past years, um, we have actually dealt with the CIP before the, the operating budget, which I always, I think that was good because it allowed us then to see how we were prioritizing the infrastructure projects. I, I think in the past, they, you know, the, the each department or, or I think they're not by departments, but category of CIPs were brought to us in January and February, you know, one each week and so forth. And I just find that very helpful because I think the infrastructure that we do with CIP projects is, is what our public is looking for a lot. So I thought that was helpful. And then, and if we need to set up additional times or even additional meetings to do the detailed budget, uh, and then if some council members don't feel the need to be here, no hard feelings, but those of us who, who want that detail, I appreciate the opportunity to have it and, I, and thank you. But I, in, in thinking in terms of, of all of this, I worry a little bit that uh, waiting to address so many of these things with the budget means that it's gonna be several months away. And I just feel like we've got some critical issues with the organization that need to be addressed sooner than the budget process would allow us to. I'm thinking in terms of the federal money with the American Rescue Plan, and I, I know that, you know, we, we were able to do things not connected with the city a lot with the CARES Act money, but I think our organization is, is in a pretty critical situation, particularly our workforce. And I would like to see us looking more uh, at using some of those funds and using them sooner. I would hope that when we get this uh, market salary survey uh, done, as we get it done in January, that maybe we could address some of the concerns uh, with some of those funds earlier uh, than, than the budget process would allow. Because I really think our workforce is at a, a very um, important state uh, with the vacancies that we have, uh, but also uh, with the, the work that needs to be done. And I think it's critical that our workforce understands how important they are to all of us. Uh, and, and the work that, that they do and the projects that they do are, are critical. And one of the things that we did during the last budget, which I think really helped our public safety, particularly our police department, was we kind of said, what do you need? What, what would be your wish list? I would like to see that from each department. And I know that they do that somewhat with the budget because there's a requested but not funded listing, which we don't really see. But I would like to know what each department feels they need, uh, whether it's, it's, it's positions filled or, or uh, if there's some critical Thing. I mean, I was reading today one of the news articles which talked about the, uh, the sh spot shooter technology that we have, if I've used the right term, which has allowed the police department in a couple of instances to determine shots fired and, and address something very quickly, which I think is so important. But just our being able to provide the money to use that technology, I think was important, uh, very important to the police department but also important to our, our, our folks understanding that we think what they think is important. And I would like to hear that from, from our, our, uh, our staffs, uh, and particularly as we are determining how to use some of this uh, money that we have uh, from the rescue plan, if, if there are infrastructure needs or, or needs that are of that nature, that we can use some of that funding for more than we have already, that's where I think it should go. I think, it, I think our organization needs attention now, and I think we need to do it as soon as we can. And if there are components of this that we can do 
prior to the budget process, I would like to know what they are because I, I think it's we're at a critical state. Thank you. Well, if I could just add, and I totally agree, Ms. Henley, the, the workforce issue, and we got the reports from the departments, and I hope those recommendations come sooner than later because I think we're ready to act on them if they make sense. Yeah, Mr. Rouse. And I'd just like to um, make it a point to thank our city manager for uh, starting this process as early as he, he has, and I know that the last budget process, um, he brought forth a very conservative um, um, budget, and, and so I just I just want to take my my hat off to uh, to you, city manager, for starting this this process and allowing us to 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 try to get the things that we're focusing on, finding ways to get those things done. So I just want to um, thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Moss. I've often said the people most underrepresented in our budget process, and maybe that's our job, are what is on the wish list of the people we serve. Because in the end, there has to be some upper limit independent of all the wants and requirements and on the wish list of our departments. Because in the end, it's not our money. That money has to be taken from people. So we need to be sure at the end when we're looking at all this, never forget that that bill gets paid by someone. <laughs> and, and we have very limited tools to progressively raise revenue. Matter of fact, we have no vehicles to progressively raise revenue. There are taxes on wealth, which is your car or your home, and then there's fees and sales taxes, which we can now not increase, but those are also regressive taxes. So I think we need to be mindful, and we also need to be thinking the government, well, depending on the elections, we may not have that half a cent that comes on grocery taxes. So someone needs to have, I'm sure Kevin's already probably done an analysis of what that probably means, but that's a revenue loss. Because remember when this tax was put on food, to throw the localities a bone, they put a half a cent local tax, and that revenue comes directly to us. Well, that would, could potentially disappear. So I think we need to be mindful that there's a lot of moving pieces on this checkboard, but what's not moving is for most people, their personal income status. And ultimately, that's the people that pay all the money. I'm not saying all, I just think we're going to have to prioritize that wish list is all I'm really saying. Not that there aren't things we need to do, sure. but we have a tough job ahead of us giving all the, I mentioned collective bargaining in my letter. We didn't mention that here. You're very kind, Kevin. <laughs> but that, that, that's another topic that has uh, policy implications, has resource implications, and uh, that's an issue we haven't yet resolved. So I just... I think we're capable of doing this task. I've been amazed what we've done the last three budget cycles, Mr. Mayor. You've done a great job shepherding that. You get a lot of credit for that. No, there were, uh, that was a group process. But we have a, I think our challenge this time around, even with maybe more money on the plate, is more difficult. <laughs> and uh, I just, and uh, I want to be a team player like everyone else, but I just want to be mindful that we cannot forget in the end the households that we have to distribute this bill against. Hey, thank you. Hey, at this point, Kevin, thank you. If I could, you know, just make it, you know, a couple points, uh, you know, of uh, interest here. Um, you know, once again, I think Mr. Rouse is 100 percent accurate. Us getting involved early on is really a good thing. Uh, we have several unknowns coming up, uh, you know, be, you know, you know, with the bond referendum and things. But at least, you know, I think we're going to be on a track. Uh, I have a couple requests, if you can think about it. Uh, with in terms of the Centerville Rec Center, at least if we can at least move forward with a, a site location, and then also a con you know perhaps a concept design in terms of, I understand Ms. Wooten, there are several options in terms of, do we want it with a joint use library? Do we want it with a community center or both? Uh, not too long ago, Chief Newdigate and I uh, visited a uh, naval facility, and it was they had a huge gym, you know, for you know, you know, specialized training, and but they also had a rehab uh, center there for you know, uh, which could be you know for their, um, you know, the folks that might have got hurt in a combat situation or an accident. You know, perhaps we can have something where the police and sheriff's department or, you know, people from public works or anything that might get hurt on the job 
where they can go in and you know get PT, chiropractic, and you know a bunch of other stuff, and then transition to a gym for a full healing thing. We might be able to contract with a you know a hospital and you know things of that nature. But once again, I think think if we could at least get into concept stage, first of all, you know, a site selection and then move forward. But I think the encouraging thing, Ms. Wooten, is that, you know, uh, as we're looking for, you know, some really significant economic development opportunities coming in, uh, hopefully that's going to be also a um, an inducement for economic development to even come here to have another uh, one of our jewel uh, rec centers here, but also um, you know, ju you know, just from you know, a, you know, pure health and community uh, component. But at least if we could at least get, take the first step now, and then, uh, you know, I'm confident that you know, what, well, over the ensuing years, our resources are going to, you know, more than be able to address that. Uh, the other thing is too, and I, ha I had a uh, breakfast with Miss Wooten the other day. Uh, one of the recommendations that came out of the two focus groups we had with the IDEA Commission was the um, creating an inception of a dis, uh, diversity and inclusion office uh, that would be under this, uh, the auspices of the city manager. Um, and this could uh, result in some of the consolidation with the Minority Business Council, the Human Rights Commission. But also, we, uh, you know, Ms. Wooten and I talked about the potential of having at least in the beginning, you know, the external review board, uh, you, you know, under there as part of an umbrella, but as part of a comprehensive, um, not only for education, for outreach, and, uh, you know, bringing people in. You know, perhaps, uh, you know, some people are going to be reluctant, uh, you know, to file a complaint against a police officer, but if they know that we have, you know, as part of, the manager's office, you know, and in fact, an ombudsman uh, that's willing to come in and you know help out with that. And I think it would be, a, you know, a great sign to the community that we're taking. Uh, you know, this was a, a group of 27 people and two focus groups that really thought that this could be an effective bridge going forward. So uh, you know, and Mr. Dehaney and I uh, did talk about it. And you know, a uh, number of cities have successfully implemented that, but but once again, it could be a potential bridge. And I and I do agree that, you know, now is going to be the time to move forward with the uh, you know citizens review panel and get that implemented. Hopefully, before the end of the year. Yeah, Miss. Well, Ms. and Henley. I think many of the things that you have said and Miss Wooten and others have said, sort of get to this concept that I have is that we kind of need to know what each department feels like they need to accomplish because if we can do it by accomplishing doing a project that accomplishes something that several different departments are trying to accomplish this whole thing of multiple benefits is is critical I, I think in terms of what we're proposing with the uh, flooding and using the uh, the Windsor Woods area, 95% of the year it's going to be a park. But when it needs to be a flooding uh, uh, system, then then it will be able to do that. If we know what everybody is, what the needs are, that everybody identifies, then we can kind of look and see the overall needs. And I think we'll find out that we could maybe accomplish the needs in in several areas in a, a similar project uh, and so that we're not out there as silos trying to do things but we are looking at the overall of, of seeing what the priorities are what the what the needs are because clearly it's our citizens and we have to see what is it that our citizens have needs for public safety is you know we, we identified that as a, a priority that we really needed to go after because people have to be safe before we can do these other things but then what are the other things we want to accomplish and that our citizens want? And where are the needs? I think that's the thing that we, we identify first. And then we say, okay, how do we accomplish these things? And we can often find that we can do it in, in, in a joint fashion instead of having to individually do things. And Ms. Henley, I think along that line, um, you know, the fact is that, you know, we are the largest uh, city in the Commonwealth of Virginia, 460,000 people, and government is complex. We have many communities, different types of communities, you know, 
uh, you know, Princess Anne is different than the resort. The resort is different than Centerville. Centerville is different than Rose Hall and on and on. But the thing is, I think if we can, you know, we, when we talk about budgeting, you know, that's just the bottom line, that's on a ledger. But what really translates out into the village in terms of us being a high touch city of yes, you know, and then, you know, once again, consumers and the ability to listen, to, you know, to find out. Folks that live in the communities know their communities better than we do. You know because they live in their communities so but once again whether it be working with uh, folks with the infill or just doing that yeah you know, i think once again we have to have a living and breathing budget that really translates into you know what mr moss you know talks about you know folks and the people folks in the homes and to make it so they can look at the government and say yeah yeah we are virginia beach okay Thank you very much. Any other p uh, comments? And Mr. Bellucci, go ahead and make that uh, recommendation. We'll put it out, then we'll do it again next time, what you talked about, the 531. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I just uh, received notification from um, Ms. Chilius and also from conversations with the city clerk's office that uh, we haven't received a lot of applications for the May 31st Memorial Committee. And so to anyone who's watching and members of the public, I would just encourage you to go to vbgov.com and find a landing page for that committee. It's a very important work. I'm excited to work with Council Member Wooten on this project and members of our community to properly um, honor the experiences of the families who um, lost loved ones that day and as well all those who were impacted by the tragedy, including um, municipal employees, family members, first responders, and our community at large. And so it's very important work, and I hope that members of our community with the skill sets particularly listed and those who are impacted will consider applying and joining that effort. And, you know, if any council member or any member of staff or any th knows somebody that may be able to make a significant contribution, you know, let's encourage, uh, you know, a proactive look at this stuff. Okay, thank you all very much. We are adjourned. Thank you.